Sweets Assessment by Windy Meadows Narrated by Lily Jane Chapter 1 I swing my handbag by its handles and whistle, Oh my darling Clementine, while I stroll down Main Street. I inhale a deep breath of the fragrant cherry blossoms billowing over the town. My whole heart wants to skip and sing and dance for joy. I breeze into the candy store and spin a pirouette. Patty and Zack stand behind the counter in their aprons. Gilly leans over the glass display case talking to them. They all turn around and stare at me when I enter. I give a final flourish and end with a sweeping bow, and all three burst into applause. Work it, Margaret! Gilly hoots. Patty laughs. That was some performance. You're awfully chipper, Mom, Zack adds. What turned you into a ray of sunshine all of a sudden? I spread my arms wide to drink in all the ecstasy filling my soul. It's springtime, my dear boy, springtime. Nothing can ever be dull in spring. Have you seen the cherry trees in bloom? I never knew the world could hold so much beauty and gladness, and it's all for me, me. I clasp my hands to my heart and close my eyes in delight. It might be spring, Patty remarks. But it's still only the end of March. We still have some cold, stormy weather to get through before the weather warms up. And don't forget the mud season. If that won't bring you down to earth, nothing will. Don't confuse me with details. I hurry toward my office. I struck it rich with that hot drinks promotion in February. Now I need to cook up another event to welcome in the spring. What about caramel apples? Gilly calls after me. Or a candy pull. Patty's voice drifts through the open office door. That's a traditional New England activity, and it fits the theme of the store. Their suggestions entice me back to the front. Those are too summery. I need something that suggests warm weather, but that doesn't steal anything from Fourth of July or the harvest theme of late summer. What suggests warm weather? Gilly asks. Shorts and t-shirts, Zack replies. Barbecues at the beach, Patty adds. Going swimming, Gilly goes on. No, no, I counter. None of those will work. What about making ice cream? Zack asks. That's a traditional summer activity, and it suggests warm weather. I cock my head to one side. Maybe. You can't go serving ice cream, Patty argues. It's still freezing outside. The ground hasn't even thawed. Zack unties his apron strings and heads for the register. Just don't start serving frosty margaritas with little paper umbrellas sticking out of the glasses. That would be taking this thing a little too far. Patty turns away, too. I'm out of here. I've got guests coming in two hours, and I need to vacuum my floor. She hangs her apron in the storeroom and opens the front door. Good night, Patty, I call to her. Thanks again. See you tomorrow. No, you won't, she returns. I'm off tomorrow. You're rostered tomorrow, Margaret, so don't tie one on tonight. Stay away from the margaritas. Everybody laughs. Zack punches buttons on the register to check out for the night. He takes the receipts and logs them into the ledger spreadsheet on his laptop. Patty pulls the door shut behind her. 
but before the latch clicks, David Graham takes it out of her hands. He and Ariel enter the store. I rotate around to greet them. Hello, you two. I hope you're keeping out of mischief. Ariel slides a stack of books onto the counter in front of me. I won't get a chance to get into any mischief. I've got enough homework to last until I'm 40. What's the matter? Zack cuts in. You're a whiz at homework. Since when do you drag yourself around like you're on your way to the thumbscrew chamber? You're usually thrilled to do your homework. Yeah, but... Ariel moans. This is different. I can't figure out differential calculus. It's too complicated. No, it's not, Gilly tells her. It's a snap once you understand it. That's easy for you to say. Ariel fires back. You're a prodigy. Not really. My dad explained it to me. I thought I was too stupid to understand it. I almost quit school over it until he sat me down and walked me through it step by step. Gilly takes hold of Ariel's stack of textbooks and swivels them toward her. Come on, I'll show you. Ariel blinks at her in wonder. Really? Did you feel the same way when you were in high school? I always thought everything came easy to you. It did. That's what my dad explained, Gilly replies. He told me that everything came easy to me, and I sailed through all my years of school before that. He said now I was hitting something I actually had to try to learn, instead of it just falling into my head with no problem. He said math is like a foreign language, and you just have to learn the words for everything to fit them into sentences. Ariel's features brighten. That's exactly how I see it. Gilly flips open the book to a bookmark. Look, see this? This explains how to calculate the integral of the function. Yeah, I understand all that, Ariel replies. It's the other processes I don't get. I throw up my hands. This is all Greek to me. You kids take it away. You could learn it too, Mom, Zack tells me. It would do you good to stretch that brain of yours. No siree, I counter. You won't catch me within ten miles of a math textbook. Ariel giggles behind her hand. You are within ten miles of one, Margaret. I wag my finger at her. Don't confuse me with details, young lady. Just let me live my life as an uncomplicated plebeian. Zack jerks his thumb over his shoulder. Come into the office. Gilly can explain it to you while I tally up these receipts. Ariel hefts her books into her arms, and the three of them disappear. David sidles up to the counter. Aren't you going to help close shop? Today was my day off. I don't have to help. What are you doing here, then? He asks. Don't you have a garden to weed or something? I roll my eyes. Oh, God, don't remind me. He laughs. Seriously, what are you doing here on your day off? I'm trying to figure out another promotion idea to welcome in the warmer weather. Patty, Zack, Gilly, and I were just talking about it. I like the idea of doing something with ice cream. He snorts. What do you think you're going to do? Scrape the ice off your windshield to make the ice cream? It's freezing out there. I arch my eyebrow at him. Don't get sarcastic with me, mister. I wasn't planning on doing any such thing. It might still be cold, but summer's just around the corner. Anyway, I wasn't thinking to make the ice cream myself. I'm far too busy for that. He throws up his hands to the ceiling. Hallelujah! She's finally seen the light. After all the time I've known you, I never thought I'd live to hear those words cross your lips. 
I punch him in the shoulder. Cut it out. Quit teasing. He laughs again, and his eyes sparkle. Okay, so you're not going to make the ice cream. So what are you going to do? You don't really have the space in here to sell it either. I know. This is just another promotion, so we would have to do it outside or at some other location, like the Happy-Go-Lucky Cafe. Which means, he adds, that you'll need to work with Stacy to promote it. Right. I don't really like selling ice creams anyway. His shoulders droop and his chin falls on his chest. He closes his eyes and groans. Oh, for the love of God, now what? I mean, I don't really want to sell ice cream cones. I was thinking of something else, like maybe milkshakes or something. He peeks up at me. Yeah, that sounds good. I would need to borrow or rent a few blenders, and I need to source the ice cream and any other ingredients I'll use. Other than that, it should be a piece of cake. He guffaws again. A piece of cake? You always say that. Well, maybe if I keep saying it enough times, that will make it true. I catch him pulling a face, and I have to grin. Anyway, that's a conversation for another day. Why don't you and Albert Einstein come over for dinner tonight? I can't, he replies. Ariel has school tomorrow, and I was up late last night at a department meeting. I just want to go home and crash, and I don't think Ariel can handle another late night hanging around your living room talking till all hours. And don't even try to stand there and tell me we won't, because we always do. The picture he draws lures me toward him. I slip my arm around his waist. I do so enjoy staying up till all hours with you. Both of you. So do I. He bends down and kisses me. I wish I could, but it won't work tonight. I don't even relish making dinner when I get home. I just want someone else to make dinner for me for a change so I can turn my brain off and relax. We can do that. How about the five of us go next door and get dinner at the cafe? I'm buying. He raises an eyebrow. Yeah? Yeah. I hug him close. You won't have to touch a dish. You talked me into it. He kisses me again. I stick my head into the office. When you're done with those receipts, Zachary, we're going next door for dinner. He looks up from the computer. We? Yeah, all five of us. Unless you have to be somewhere, Gilly. I'm taking you two and David and Ariel out for dinner. I'm finished. He sticks the last receipts in the cash bag and drops it into the safe. He spins the lock and shuts his laptop. I'm pretty sure these two are ready to go, too. I move around the desk to inspect the notebook in front of Gilly and Ariel. Are you sure? I don't want to take too much time away from you doing your homework. Ariel jumps up. You don't have to worry about that. Gilly explained everything. Integrals are easy when you understand them. I can finish this in no time once I get home. She slams the book closed. Great. Meet me out front when you're ready. Chapter 2 I scribble in my notebook between serving customers at the store. I make up a list of the different flavors of milkshakes I want to serve for the promotion. This will really be a ripper. At lunchtime, I close the store and take my notebook next door. I'm still deep in thought when a white van pulls up across the street. It carries two ladders on its roof rack. The driver gets out and sets up a ladder against the building directly opposite. I halt on the sidewalk and frown at the sight. 
No one has gone near Mr. Stewart's old dog grooming parlor since he was murdered there a few months ago. I linger outside until the handyman, or whatever he is, raises a sign and hangs it from the storefront. Old Time Ice Cream Parlor. Now I scowl at the place. Who's opening up an ice cream parlor in West End just when I came up with the idea to sell milkshakes? How dare they steal my thunder? I storm off in a huff. I won't stand for it. It's not fair. I'm still steaming when I enter the happy-go-lucky for lunch. I don't notice Stacy Kuntz coming up behind me until she claps her hand on my shoulder. I jump out of my skin, spinning around. Holy mackerel! You scared me! She breaks into happy laughter. What did you think I was? The ghost of Christmas past? She chortles at her own joke. Seriously, are you here for lunch, or did you just want to shoot the breeze? No, I'm here for lunch. She cocks her head to examine me. Are you okay, Margaret? You look a little distracted. I glance over my shoulder. Did you notice someone's opening an ice cream parlor across the street? Her eyes fly open. Yeah, I think it's great. There's a new barbecue restaurant opening up out on the highway entrance, too. Really? I didn't know that. Well, it isn't exactly opening up as such, she replies. They just applied for the building permits, but they're bound to get them. Who is? I ask. Oh, I don't know. She flaps her hands. It will be someone from out of town, though. New businesses are opening up all over. This town is jumping. The more the merrier, I say. I furrow my brow in thought. If an ice cream parlor is opening up across the street, maybe I should rethink this whole promotion idea. Maybe I should scrap the milkshakes and go with something else. But I don't want to turn my back on all the work I've already put in. Not that I've put in a lot of work. Just a few days' worth of thought, that's all. When I come to my senses, I find Stacy studying me and she doesn't have her usual glowing smile on. She lowers her voice to a murmur. Say, Margaret, you're not one of those people who's against newcomers moving into town, are you? Who, me? My hand flies to my heart. Not at all. I'm all for it. Phew! She passes her knuckles across her forehead. That's a relief. Some people are vehement about keeping West End just for us, which I say is ridiculous. I mean, we all came here from somewhere else, too. It would be stupid to hoard the town to ourselves when so many people want to share what's great and beautiful about the place. I agree with you, Stacy. I tell her. I'm just thinking, that's all. I was thinking about doing a promotion selling ice cream milkshakes, but with the ice cream parlor opening up across the street, now I'm not so sure. That's the only thing I was thinking. Her face bursts into glorious, beaming happiness all over again. Oh, that explains it. Wow, I got the wrong impression, didn't I? That's okay. It was an honest mistake. She leans in and touches on my arm. Hey, did you hear that someone finally bought Maddie Sinclair's old house? That place has been on the market for almost ten years, and when the buyers took possession, they found a hornet's nest in the roof. Well, buyer beware, I tell her. I probably should have been more careful about buying my house. It had some maintenance issues, and... People said it was haunted, but I'm happy with it, warts and all. I wouldn't have it any other way. I know what you mean, she exclaims. You should have seen some derelicts I bought when I started out. 
gosh, I wouldn't touch them with a ten-foot pole now. I just hope some of these newcomers buying houses in West End do their homework. I go on. I hope not too many people get burned, or our charming little town could end up with a bad reputation we can't get rid of. You better believe it, she fires back. I know some locals are jacking up their prices, trying to take advantage of the boom. Newcomers want old houses with a lot of charm. They could wind up with more than they bargained for, I reply. Locals might want to make money, but if property values go too high, the buyers will move elsewhere. Stacy lowers her voice to a whisper. Don't tell anyone I said so, but I think that's exactly what the locals want to do. They want to drive people away. They want to stop people from moving to West End by making property too expensive to buy. I shake my head. That's a shame. People should be less judgmental. Not to mention hospitable. She picks up a menu. Are you ready to eat? She guides me to a table near the back. Since I'm on my own, I don't get a booth like usual. I understand that, but I find myself seated in a part of the cafe I don't usually frequent. I wind up looking out the window at Main Street, right at the handyman putting up that sign. Old Time Ice Cream Parlor. I can't get away from it. So, that's my competition. I wonder how soon they plan to open. Maybe I can ride their coattails by holding my promotion before they come to town. I can only hope. I'd planned to spend lunch cooking up ideas for my promotion, but instead, I don't touch my notebook. If I'm not going to do this promotion, what's the point? I should just drop it now. While I'm sitting there munching my club sandwich, Another van pulls up behind the handyman. Two guys in white overalls get out and truck fridges and equipment into what used to be the dog grooming parlor. I guess I won't be able to think of it as that anymore. Will I ever be able to enjoy an ice cream from there without getting a distinct taste of dog in my mouth? In a few months... No one will remember that it ever was a dog grooming parlor. That's the way it is in small towns. People have short memories, especially when there's ice cream involved. I spend the rest of the workday glaring across the street as workmen set up the ice cream parlor right under my nose. I take it as a personal affront that someone is opening an ice cream parlor at such an inconvenient time for me. They should have checked with me first and gotten my permission. God, I'm starting to think like a petulant toddler if I expect the world to revolve around what works best for me and my promotion schedule. At closing time, I toss my notebook into my handbag and storm off in a peevish snit. I need to pull myself together. I get home to an empty house. Zack and Gilly aren't around, so I'm on my own. I go to the kitchen, but I don't feel like cooking. I decide to just snack before I hit the hay. I pull open the fridge, but nothing catches my fancy. I open the freezer... That's when I spot the ice cream container Ariel brought over the last time she and David came for dinner. We didn't eat it, so it's been sitting there forgotten ever since. I prick up my antenna. What if this promotion really could work? Even if the new ice cream parlor opens right away, which it probably won't, selling milkshakes might just dovetail into it with no problem. The two might even benefit together. It could work. I take out the container, but when I set it on the counter, I get another idea. 
I'm making milkshakes, right? Why not try one out, just to pilot the whole concept? It couldn't hurt, anyway. I'm old enough to give myself permission to have a milkshake for dinner instead of a healthy meal. This will be the first time I've fallen off the nutrition wagon in nearly 30 years, so I figure I'm entitled to a little indulgence. I pull out the blender and scoop in a healthy dose of ice cream. I pour in a dollop of milk and hunt around in the cupboards until I find a tin can of strawberries in syrup. That's just perfect. I also find a can of pineapple and a glass jar of maraschino cherries. This is wonderful. I can trial three flavors without leaving the house. I'm in heaven. I switch on the blender. It whizzes the ingredients around and turns them into a frosty concoction, the perfect icy consistency of a milkshake. While pouring it into a glass and taking my first sip, the front door opens. Zack and Gilly bundle into the house. Zack's eyebrows fly up when he sees what I'm doing. What's that, Mom? I'm doing a trial run on the milkshakes. This is good. Do you want to try it? He lifts the glass out of my hand and takes a sip. My creation leaves a pink mustache across his upper lip. He smacks his tongue and peers up at the ceiling, thinking about it. Gilly borrows the glass out of his hand and goes through the same pantomime. I hold my breath, waiting for the verdict. Well, what do you think? Zack gives me back the glass. I don't know, Mom. It's really good, don't get me wrong, but I think it's missing something. Like what? I ask. I added milk and ice cream and strawberries. What else does a milkshake need? I'm not adding extra sugar, so don't even suggest it. No, it's sweet enough as it is. It's something else. He heads for the entry and leaves me there holding the glass. Hey! I call after him. Wait a minute! You can't leave until you tell me what it needs! I can't tell you that, Mom. I'm no expert on ice cream products. He's already halfway up the stairs. Why don't you ask those people opening up the ice cream parlor on Main Street? They're bound to know everything about milkshakes. Gilly gives me a sheepish smile and hurries after him. I stare at my now-empty hall. The glass goes cold in my hand, or is that my confidence melting? I thought the shake tasted perfect when I first put it to my lips. I thought I could do no wrong. Now I never want to see another milkshake again as long as I live. I go back to the kitchen and return the ice cream to the freezer. I also put the pineapple and cherries away. I won't be making any more shakes tonight. I can see that. Aw, oh, what the heck? I've still got a blender full of an acceptable milkshake and nothing else made for dinner. I take another sip. Dang, Zack's right. It is missing something. Chapter 3 I get to the store at 10 o'clock the next day. My eyes pop when I spot Gilly behind the counter with Zack. She wears a white apron. What are you doing here? She blushes. I'm just hanging out, so I thought I would make myself useful. She's a natural, Mom. Zack chimes in. She's going to make a great addition to our executive board. I look back and forth from one to the other. Executive board? When we incorporate and expand into a chain of franchises across the country, he replies. She can be our chief financial officer. She elbows him and her cheeks flush. 
That's you, not me. Seriously, I ask. Aren't you supposed to be in school? I thought you were studying clinical psychology at Wesleyan. What happened to that? She bows her head. I graduated. My jaw drops. You graduated? When were you going to break the news to the rest of us? Don't tell me you invited Zach to your graduation ceremony and you didn't invite me. It's not that, Margaret, she replies. There was confusion with my classes. They changed the degree requirements, so it turned out I already completed all the coursework to get my degree. I finished early, so I won't get to do the commencement ceremony until June with the rest of the graduating class. I don't have any more courses. I'm applying for a fellowship with the Mental Health and Addiction Services, but I won't find out if I got it for another six weeks. I also applied for a graduate program at Wesleyan, and I won't find out about that for another three months. That's the downside of graduating early. I'm just trying to stay out of trouble in the meantime. I blink at her in amazement. Wow! Congratulations! I'm sorry I presumed. That's okay. It's a little awkward serving candy after being in school for the last twenty years. I squeeze her arm. You go right on doing it. You're more than welcome. And if you need a paying job, just let me know, and we can put you on the roster. Now she blushes with pleasure. Thanks, Margaret. I head to my office. Zack calls after me through the door. What are you up to, Mom? I'm not staying. I noticed those new people are over at the ice cream parlor, so I'm going across the street to talk to them about the milkshakes. Good idea, he replies. Good for you for getting back on the horse, Margaret, Gilly adds. I'm glad to see you're not losing heart. Me? Lose heart? Never. I grab my notebook and march out the door. Main Street is now a van-free zone. Now a sparkly pink Cadillac parks in front of the ice cream parlor. I see two people through the plate glass windows. A gray-haired man sticks his head into one of the freezer display cases, fiddling with something. An equally gray woman sprays cleaner on shelves behind the counter and wipes them down with a towel. I try the door and find it locked. The man scowls. He says something to the woman and they both hesitate. They don't come anywhere near the door or make any move to let me in. I go into a paroxysm of hand motions and wild antics, trying to communicate who I am and what I want. I point to myself and then across the street to the candy store. I point to the notebook and make complicated facial expressions in the moronic hope they can read lips. They only frown at me and mutter to each other. They must think I've cracked a cylinder, or maybe that I'm some maniac escaped from the psych ward. I wouldn't blame them for thinking it. At last, they arrive at some decision or other. The man closes the case and advances on the door. He unlocks it, but he only opens it a crack. We're closed. We don't open for another week. I hold back from jamming my foot into the crack before he slams it in my face. I'm not here to buy anything. I'm Margaret Nichols from the candy store across the street. I just want to talk to you about something for a fraction of a second. It won't take long, I promise. The man casts another blank look at the woman, who shrugs and turns away. The man eases the door open. You're not trying to sell us anything, are you? Not at all. Actually, I was wondering if I could buy something from you. The man whips around. What? I'm planning a promotion selling ice cream milkshakes. 
I was wondering if you wanted to go in on a combined promotion with me by providing the ice cream. I did something similar with Kathy Nielsen from the craft shop across town. We sold hot drinks and soup in the middle of winter. It was a big hit. The woman peers through the front window. It's not far off from the middle of winter now. It's not exactly ice cream weather. But you're still planning to open in a week, right? I point out. We could set up here in front of your store so everyone knows the delicious ice cream supplied in the shakes came from you. So what do you propose to provide? The man demands. I'll provide all the other ingredients, the rented blenders, and the cost of radio, newspaper, and other marketing. What do you say? The couple exchange glances, and the man scratches his neck. I guess it could work. Great! I jump up and down in excitement. That's what comes of almost having the door slammed in my face. The woman comes up behind him and sticks out her hand. It's nice to meet you. I'm Abigail Johnson, and this is my husband, Cedric. You're the first person we've met in West End. I shake her hand. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. I hope you haven't had any less than hospitable encounters with anyone from town. She cocks her head and frowns. What do you mean? Oh, I don't know. I just heard some people aren't too enthusiastic about the town growing as fast as it is. Some people, not me, you understand, but some people don't want newcomers moving in. They want to keep West End small and charming. They look at each other. That explains it. Explains what? I ask. Did something happen? Not really, Cedric replies. It's just that we haven't been able to buy a house in town yet. We have our eye on a house in the western neighborhood, but the woman who owns it doesn't want to sell. It's her daughter who wants to sell it. Really? Who owns it? Maybe I know the people. Florence Smith, Abigail replies. She's 95 years old, and her daughter Betty wants to sell the house and put her mother in an assisted living facility. Yeah, but Florence is still in good shape, I point out. She still drives for Pete's sake. She's as sharp as a tack, and as far as I know, she's perfectly fine living on her own. She even hauls her own firewood. I hope I'm half as healthy when I'm 95. Well, it was her daughter who listed the house for sale, Cedric argues. We made an offer on it in good faith, and the offer was accepted. Then we found out Betty doesn't even own the house and had no right to list it. Now the whole case is going to mediation because the old lady is refusing to leave. We only hope it gets resolved soon, because we have nowhere to live. We're staying at the Overlook Hotel for the time being, and all our belongings are in storage. But that's not exactly a sustainable situation for us. No, I imagine it isn't, I remark. You have a business to run, after all. Abigail claps her hands. Anyway, enough doom and gloom. Let's talk about this promotion idea of yours. What's your plan? I tap my notebook. I have some ideas for the different flavors, and I plan to cost out the other ingredients. I was just waiting to talk to you about the ice cream, because if I couldn't get you to chip in, I would have to buy it myself. If you're on board, then I can refigure my costs. Why don't you email us your figures? She hands me a business card. What flavors have you decided on? Well, now I start to hedge. I did a trial run the other night with strawberry, but the two people who tasted it said it was missing something. I can't figure out what that would be because it tasted all right to me. 
What ingredients did you use? Abigail asks. We've been running ice cream shops all our lives. If we can't figure it out, no one can. I used vanilla ice cream, milk, and a can of strawberries in syrup. Did you use malt? She asks. A milkshake has to have malt. My eyes pop. Malt! I didn't think of that. Of course. She brightens. Problem solved. I tap the business card. Great. I'll just scoot back to my store and finalize the numbers on this promotion. I'll get them emailed to you before the end of the day. I shake hands with both of them, but when I get back to the candy store, I find Gilly alone behind the counter. She's in the middle of filling a jar with Smarties from the box. Are you okay, sweetie? She beams at me. This is fun, Margaret. Where's Zach? He's in the office. She concentrates on her job. When I get to the office, I discover Zach sitting in my desk chair. He flips through a large manual and scowls at the contents. What's going on, darling? He doesn't look up. I'm applying to business schools. I'm just trying to figure out all these entrance requirements. It's complicated, Mom. I freeze in my tracks. Your business school? Really? Yeah, I figure if I'm going to become the CEO of our nationwide franchise corporation, I better know my stuff. Gilly suggested it, actually. I hope you don't mind. It means I won't be able to work at the store for a few years, but I'll be able to help out with the management behind the scenes, if you get my meaning. Oh, sweetie! I lunge at him and throw my arms around his neck. I'm so proud of you. I couldn't be more pleased. You're going to be great. He blushes into his magazine. Thanks, Mom. Chapter 4 I borrow Zach's car and run down to Peterborough. I drive to the restaurant supply warehouse to cost out sprinkles, chopped nuts, chocolate syrup, and a bunch of other stuff I'll need for the milkshakes. I'm in a tizzy trying to account for everything and make my proposal to the Johnsons as professional as possible. I suppose it's inevitable that they'll find out sooner or later that I'm a hopeless amateur when it comes to business, but I'd prefer they find out later. I bustle into the warehouse and locate the confectionery aisle. The instant I set eyes on the shelves, I get overwhelmed with choices. The place carries a thousand more varieties of everything than I imagined, and they're all in bulk quantities. I start scribbling as fast as I can. I have to keep reminding myself that I'll be offering a limited number of flavors at the promotion. I can't get carried away offering absolutely everything. I jot down the price per pound for chocolate sprinkles, nuts, and colored sprinkles, along with the quantity of each package and the price per package. My forehead breaks out in a sweat, trying to juggle all the numbers and remember everything I've written down and thought of in the last few days. If I leave anything out of my proposal, the Johnsons might balk. I wouldn't be surprised. They don't know me from a hole in the ground. I change aisles to look at the paper cups. I make a mental note that I still have to contact the rental company about the blenders, when someone touches my shoulder, I whip around with a gasp. Stacy, what are you doing here? She points her chin at my notebook. It looks like I'm doing the same thing you are. I'm costing out paper plates and cups. I was thinking to start doing a delivery service for takeout around the West End area. That's a great idea. I'm sure it will be a big success. She nods toward my notes again. Let me guess. The milkshakes? 
Yeah. I wipe my shirt cuff across my brow. It appears I'm getting a little overly invested in it, like I usually do. She smiles at me. That's why you're such a winner, Margaret. You really care, and you put your heart and soul into everything you do. That's what makes people love you so much. I'm sure your milkshakes will be a great success, too. I hope you're right. I'm going in with Abigail and Cedric Johnson from the ice cream parlor. They're going to supply the ice cream, and I'm going to supply everything else. Yeah? She cocks her head. I haven't met them yet. They're nice. That gives me an idea. Hey, Stacy, what do you know about Florence Smith? Nothing you don't already know. You've met her, Margaret. You know what she's like. She's pushing a hundred years old and still going strong. I correct myself. I guess I really meant was, what do you know about her relationship with her daughter, Betty? Do they get along all right? Stacy rolls her eyes. Oh, that. What? I ask. What do you know? Betty's a tricky one, she replies. I wouldn't say she doesn't get along with her mother. They get along fine. It's just that they have different ideas about things. Things? Like what? Stacy narrows her eyes at me. What's this all about? You're not sleuthing again, are you? I'm not sleuthing. I'm just curious. When I was in the Johnson's ice cream parlor earlier, they were talking about Florence. They want to buy her house. Betty put it on the market without Florence's permission, and the Johnsons made an offer that was accepted. Now the whole thing is going to mediation because Betty didn't have the right to list the place for sale, and Florence doesn't want to move. Stacy's features clear. Oh, now I understand. Betty has had her eye on that house for years. She told me point blank she's just waiting for her mother to die so she can get her inheritance and sell the house. It's like she's angry at her mother for being healthy and staying alive. You never heard such nonsense. But Betty just wants the money. She doesn't care about anyone but herself. My mouth falls open. Really? That's awful. You're telling me. She's a heartless toad, if you ask me. She's always been like that. I went to school with her, so I should know. She's never had a thought for anyone but herself. She's one of those, what do you call them? Narcissists. She's a narcissist. She's incapable of considering anyone else's needs or interests. It's all about her. The Johnsons say Betty wants to put Florence in an assisted living facility, I remark. That's just fiddle-faddle, Stacy snaps. That woman is a rock. She can run the house perfectly well on her own. She doesn't need anybody scrubbing her back in the shower, and she certainly doesn't need to be pushing a walker around all day. Man, that woman could wrestle a tiger, so help me. I guess that means the Johnsons will have to buy another house. That gives me more ideas. I should go see her. I've never really gotten to know her very well. I've only ever seen her at community events, but we've never really talked. You should, Stacy urges. She always likes visitors, and she doesn't get out so much anymore now that she's not working. We part and I drive back to West End, full of a million thoughts. When I get to the store, I put Florence Smith out of my mind to concentrate on my proposal for the Johnsons. I assemble all my costs and forecasts and a whole lot of other stuff. I feel like I'm writing in Chinese. I really need someone with an MBA to help me with this kind of thing. I guess it's good Zack is going to business school, especially since he's planning to incorporate the store and turn it into a chain across the country. 
I fire off the email and sit back in contentment. Now all I have to do is wait for their reply. A notification comes up on my phone. When I check it, I notice the time. It's 5.30 in the afternoon. Zack and Gilly will be closing up soon. That brings my mind back to Florence. I go to the display and take out one of my finest boxes of chocolates, the one with the red bow on top. I walk to the western neighborhood and stop in front of Florence Smith's house. It's a dilapidated old Georgian that has seen better days, but nothing a little paint and elbow grease won't fix. Boston Ivy trails around the corner posts and drips from the front porch. It makes the house look extra grand and mysterious. No wonder the Johnsons want to buy it. This place screams character. I climb the steps and knock. The sound echoes to the ends of the earth. Did I make a mistake coming unannounced? Is this place haunted or something? I'm about to walk away and forget the whole project when footsteps approach from inside. The door opens and I meet Florence Smith face to face. She looks the same as she did the last time I saw her in town. She's over six feet tall with long snow white hair down to her waist. She wears it in a loose braid that drapes over her shoulder. She stands up straight with a healthy dose of muscle under her loose plaid shirt. She bursts into a grin that accentuates all the wrinkles in her leathery face. She looks sun-kissed and hale for a woman her age. Margaret Nichols, as I live and breathe. Come on in. I was just about to put the kettle on. She waves me inside a spotless house lined with faded carpet and some old family portraits on the walls. I follow her all the way to the back. She enters a bright kitchen that smells of cinnamon and apple cider. Take a seat. What will you have to drink? She walks to the stove and turns on the gas under an old-fashioned metal tea kettle. I ease into the chair. I'll have whatever you're having. I brought you some candy. She breaks into a hearty laugh. You're trying to corrupt me. My doctor says I'm not supposed to eat that stuff at my age, but I won't lie to you. It will be gone before the hour's out. She comes to the table and sits down next to me. She takes hold of the box and slides off the lid. You'll have to help me with this. Oh no, not me. She makes me laugh. I have enough trouble staying away from the merchandise. She laughs again. She looks like a sprite from the forest, but I can't remember seeing any woman as healthy and vibrant as she is, not even a woman a third her age. Even some twenty-year-olds I know would be lucky to have her energy. She takes a candy, bites into it, and collapses back in her seat. Her eyes roll upward, and she groans in ecstasy. I can't stop laughing at her clowning. So, she says when she finishes eating it, what brings you around our neck of the woods? I bend over the cup of tea she hands me. There was a rumor afoot that you were going to sell your house. I wondered if it was true, so I thought I'd come over and get the truth straight from the horse's mouth. I'll never sell. She looks around the kitchen. Do you know my father signed the Articles of Incorporation for West End when it was only four hand-constructed buildings? I was seven years old, and I stood right next to him when he put his name on it. Main Street was a muddy dirt track between nowhere and somewhere else. My mother cried because we were moving so far from what she called civilization. Can you believe that? She laughs again. My, how the times have changed. I can't stop gazing at her. You must have seen some amazing changes in your time. 
I have, and I'm sure I'll see a lot more before I'm through. I don't plan on dying any time in the near future. Anyone who has their eye on this house better pack a lunch, cause it's gonna be a while. I nod. I can see that for myself. She jumps up. Hey, come here. I want to show you something. She hustles to the back door and yanks it open with unnatural strength. Do you see that? I stare out at a huge vegetable garden. Perennial herbs line the worn brick walkway. Between them, large swaths of black soil lie freshly turned and exposed to the cold winter sun. I gasp in shock. Did you do all that yourself? Did you turn all that ground on your own? No one did it for me, she crows. I gotta keep in shape, and I just can't seem to shake my upbringing. Back then, we raised as much of our food as we could grow. We preserved it and used it all through the year. It doesn't seem right to give that up just because the times have changed. Besides, it's easier to go to the pantry for a jar of peaches than it is to drive to the grocery store in Peterborough. I guess in some ways, certain things haven't changed much. I can't stop gawking at that yard. No way could I turn over all that soil with no help. I would drop dead before I got to the end of the first row. I turn my attention on Florence. She beams down at me with a glow in her cheeks. I've seen enough. Well, I can see you're right. You're not going anywhere for a while, so I'll put down the rumors to meaningless chit-chat around town. Good. She escorts me back to the front door. I pause before I leave. Would it be all right if I came to visit you again in the next couple of days? I'd like to get acquainted with you. I feel bad that I let it go so long. You're always welcome, she replies. I don't get many visitors. Great. I look forward to it. I walk back to town deep in thought. Now I'm certain Florence doesn't need to move. She's perfectly capable of taking care of herself, and her daughter is going to be waiting a long, long time before she inherits that house. Maybe that's why Betty tried to pull a fast one by selling it out from under Florence without getting her mother's permission. I make my way through town toward my own neighborhood. Night is fast approaching, and the air bites colder now that the sun falls behind the trees. I'm about to turn off Main Street when a familiar figure appears, coming from the happy-go-lucky. Stacy hails me. Howdy, stranger. How are the milkshakes coming along? I brighten when I see her. I'm just waiting to hear from the Johnsons if they want to go in with me. I went to visit Florence Smith. I'm just coming from her house now. I swear, Stacy, I hope I look like that in about 50 years. She bursts out laughing. I know what you mean. We better get started on all that clean living and exercise now. I make a face. Somehow I don't think it's going to happen. She sure is an inspiration, though, isn't she? Stacy gasps and her eyes open. Hey, we should go visit her together. I haven't seen her for ages. I'm going back in the next day or two. She says she doesn't get many visitors. How about tomorrow? She suggests. I could bring a pie. I crack a grin. I don't know if she would approve of that. I took her a box of chocolates, and she said she could get in trouble with her doctor. She sure seemed to enjoy them, though. That settles it. She squeezes my arm. I gotta run now. Come by the cafe tomorrow morning and we'll go. She hurries away into the gathering twilight. I'm looking forward to getting home, too. I turn toward the eastern neighborhood when another notification comes up on my phone. When I tap the message, I read, 
Hi, Margaret. Your proposal looks very good. We look forward to collaborating with you on this. Why don't you stop by the ice cream parlor, and we can decide what flavors of ice cream to use, and how much of each we need to set aside for the promotion. Kind regards, Abigail Johnson. My heart leaps. This is wonderful. This is better than wonderful. This is great. I hurry on my way, but at the last second before I leave town, I notice a glimmer coming from the ice cream parlor. The Johnsons must be working late. I'll just stop in and thank them now before I go home. I walk up to the ice cream parlor, expecting a similar routine to the last time I was here. When I try the door, though, I find it open. I poke my head in and call, Anybody home? Abigail rushes out of the back room. Margaret, that was quick. I just got your email. I wanted to come over and thank you in person before I went home. I can't wait to get started on everything with you. She waves toward the freezer displays lining the shop. Do you want to decide on the ice cream flavors now? We don't have to, I reply. I know it's late, and I didn't come over for a lengthy business meeting. I just wanted to thank you in person. I'll get out of your hair now. It's really not a problem, she counters. We don't mind doing it now. I look around. Where's Cedric? He's here, she waves over her shoulder. He's in the office. He's on the phone with our lawyer about the house. Oh. I pull my head in quick. I go into a deer-in-the-headlights response on the subject. Should I tell her I met Florence and I think she's fine to continue living on her own? Before I can decide what to do, Abigail leans through the back door like she heard something. Then she spins around. I better get back there. I don't want to miss anything. Shall we catch up tomorrow? Tomorrow? I'm meeting Stacy to go visit Florence tomorrow. My schedule is looking awfully crowded all of a sudden. She backs away and points to me. I'll see you then. Have a good evening. She disappears and leaves me to let myself out. Chapter 5 Stacy picks up a golden apple pie from the cafe counter and slips it into a white paper box. I hope she likes this. I admire the pie. I'm sure she will. I only hope she doesn't expect us to eat it with her. This could turn into something dangerous. She shoots me a wicked grin. Let's get out of here before anyone asks me to do anything. We slip out of the cafe and make our way down Main Street. We wind our way back to Florence's house. The building doesn't look as menacing and eerie as it did the first time I came. Now it looks welcoming and homelike. I can't wait to get inside and see Florence again. She gives me new hope for life. Stacy raises her hand, but when she knocks, the door creaks open a few inches. I frown. That's odd. I wonder why she didn't latch it. I lean through the opening. Florence! Florence, are you home? No one answers. My voice vanishes in the silence. Stacy and I exchange glances. Maybe she's out, Stacy whispers. If she went out, she would have shut the door and probably locked it. I point out. I stick my head farther in. Florence? It's me, Margaret from the candy store, and Stacy Koontz from the cafe. Are you in there? The door angles a little farther into the hall. No sound comes from within. This is really strange, and now I get the old prickling sensation that tells me something's not right. Let's go in and leave the pie and a note. Stacy hangs back. Her eyes stare, and she doesn't reply. 
I feel weird about going into a woman's house without being invited, but I would feel worse about leaving. I step into the hall. Now I get a strong sense of wrongness. The house seemed so alive and comforting yesterday. Now it gives me the creeps. I wave down the hall. I'll just check in the kitchen. If we're going to leave a note, we should put it there. She's bound to find it. I go to the kitchen and find everything in order, except Florence isn't there. I hunt up a pen and a piece of paper and start to write out a note to her. When a piercing scream shatters the stillness, I rush into the hall. I don't see Stacy anywhere, but a gasping noise draws me to a tidy living room through a different door. I come upon Stacy panting and moaning with the pie barely balanced on her fingertips. I snatch it out of her hands before I notice what she's staring at. Florence lies on her back. A pool of blood under her soaks into the living room carpet. Her long white hair trails in the mess, and I can see at first glance that she's dead. Her animated face hangs from her bones in a deathly pallor the color of wax. Her mouth sags open, and her jaw juts out to one side. I struggle to pull myself together, but Stacy's hyperventilating doesn't help. I have to control myself so I don't lose my grip on reality. I do my best to steady my hands, putting the pie on a nearby table. Then I return to Stacy's side. I take hold of her shoulders. Come on, we have to get out of here. Come on, it's all right. Come out onto the porch and I'll call Detective Graham. She submits to my direction, but she won't stop staring and wheezing for every breath. My first instinct compels me to park her to the kitchen, but my rational mind takes over. I have to get her out of the house, away from the crime scene. I steer her to the porch and lower her into a wicker chair. I sit next to her and hold her hand while I get out my phone. Normally, I would text David in a situation like this, but I call him instead. I hold my breath, waiting for him to pick up. He'll see my name appear when the call goes through. I pray to God he's not in a department meeting with his sergeant or something like that. His gruff voice answers. What's up? I swallow to get my voice working. We just found Florence Smith murdered in her house. It looks pretty bad. Her head has been smashed in, and there's blood everywhere. He clips down the line in that short, harsh bark he uses for official business. Who's we? Stacy Kuntz and I came to visit Florence. We found the door open, and we came inside to leave her a note. We just found her in the living room. All right, I'm on my way, and I'm calling out the forensics team, too. Make sure you don't contaminate the crime scene. Like he needed to tell me. We're outside now. We won't go back in. Good. Is that a softening I hear in his voice, or am I just imagining it? Maybe you should take Stacy home. I hesitate to say what's going through my mind. Do you... Do you want me to come back here afterward? Of course. Now he sounds more like himself. I could really use your help, if you're not too busy with something else. I'll be here as soon as I can. Thanks. I hang up and turn my attention to Stacy. She's not handling this well. Now that her panting and staring starts to fade, the horror and grief sets in. Tears stand in her eyes, and her lip quivers. I put my arm around her shoulders. Come on, I'll take you back to town. I never... I never... She stammers. I never saw someone so dead before. My shoulders slump. I wish I could say that. I wish I hadn't seen so many dead people. Now I'm immune to the emotional trauma of finding someone beaten to death in their own home. 
Florence was so happy and healthy and, well, alive. I never met anyone as alive as she was, and now she's dead. Someone must have really hated her to kill her like that. I can think of only one person who fits that description, but I've got more important things to worry about. I hug Stacy and help her to her feet. I keep hold of her, walking back to town. Do you want to go to the cafe, or do you want to go home? She blinks back tears. I'll go to the cafe. If I can keep busy, maybe I can put it out of my mind. I know what that's like. I escort her to her place of business. When we walk in the door, we run into a bunch of people. They stand at the counter, waiting to be seated for lunch. Abigail and Cedric Johnson spin around when they see me. They both break into delighted grins. Margaret, just the person we were hoping to find. Are you ready to talk about the ice cream now? This couldn't come at a worse time. Stacy sobs and moans in my arms. I think fast to find an appropriate way to extricate myself from my predicament. Will you excuse me for just a moment? I conduct Stacy to her office and put her in her chair. Tears streak down her cheeks. She was alive yesterday! How could this happen? I kneel down in front of her. Are you sure you shouldn't go home for the day? She wipes the tears off her face and tries to straighten up. No, I'll be fine. I just need to put my shoulder to the wheel and soldier on. She bursts into a flood of tears. I'm so sorry, Margaret. I'm not as strong as you. You don't have to apologize to me, I tell her. There's no shame in going home if you can't handle it. I can handle it. She seizes her account book. I have to handle it. I'll be fine. Thank you for coming. I'll see you later. I retreat out of the room. I only hope and pray she's all right, but I really need to get back to the crime scene. I want to know what the forensics team finds. I emerge near the counter. Cedric peers around me toward Stacy's office. What was that all about? She looks like she's seen a ghost. Not a ghost. Florence Smith was killed in her house. We just found her body, so Stacy's understandably upset about it. The pair gets serious real quick. Oh, how terrible. Yeah, I gotta get back there and give a statement to the detective in charge. I'm sorry I can't stay and talk to you about the ice cream right now. I hope you understand. That's all right, Abigail replies. We were just leaving anyway. I wave toward the cafe. Weren't you going to stay for lunch? We were just meeting someone, but they didn't show up. Cedric checks his watch. It's been half an hour, so I guess they aren't coming. Oh, who are you meeting? Abigail turns away. Goodbye, Margaret. I hope the police find out who killed Florence. They leave without another word. I stare after them. Did they just avoid my question? Or am I imagining things? Chapter 6 I hurry back to Florence's house to find the place swarming with forensics people. I duck under the cordon tape and find David taking notes in the living room. An outline in masking tape on the carpet shows where Florence's body used to lie. A young man in a white jumpsuit moves around the spot taking photographs of the bloodstains. I draw up next to David. What have you got? Not a lot. He snaps his notebook closed. We found a bloody tire iron in the garage, but the techs weren't able to lift any prints from it. We sent it to the lab for a full analysis, but if it comes back with Florence's blood on it, that doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know. Other than that, 
We haven't found any other prints in the house besides Florence's, her daughter Betty's, yours, and Stacy's, which also doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know. So I'd say at this point we've got exactly zilch. What about motive? I ask. Any clues on that? He cocks his head to examine me. Is there something you want to tell me? I shift from one foot to the next and glance around the room. What do you mean? You always get that tone in your voice when you're trying to insinuate something without coming straight out and saying it. You did it just now when you asked about the motive. Do you have something you want to get off your chest? I fidget some more. Ah, oh, what am I trying to hide it from him for? All right, I hear on the grapevine that Betty was after her mother's money. She told Stacy that she was waiting for her mother to die so she could cash in on the house. He nods and scribbles in his notes again. Uh-huh, that sounds like a pretty good motive to me. There's also Abigail and Cedric Johnson. He raises one eyebrow. Never heard of them. That's because they just moved into town. They opened that ice cream parlor across the street from the candy store. What does that have to do with the murder? He asks. I hold up one hand. Hold on, I'm getting to that. Betty listed the house for sale without her mother's permission. The Johnsons made an offer on it, and the offer was accepted before it came out that Betty didn't have legal title to the house and had no business listing it or accepting an offer on it. Now, the whole case is going to mediation, but if you ask me, it looks pretty obvious that they weren't going to get it because Florence wouldn't budge, and she was the legal owner of the house. He nods. So, now that she's dead, it falls in their favor. I'm with you. That gives them a motive, too. So, do you want to go question them? Not yet. He waves me toward the exit. Let's wait until some of the test results come in. Then we'll know where we stand. I scan the living room. It feels so desolate without Florence in it. Even her dead body lent the place with some warmth. Now it reminds me of a tomb. David touches my arm. Are you okay? You're not getting your pre-case blues, are you? I heave a heavy sigh. I guess I am. Come on, I'll drive you back to town. He conducts me out of the house and hands me into the passenger seat of his car. We drive to the candy store in silence. He parks and turns to me. Why don't you come to the station tomorrow and we'll start our investigation then? That will give you some time to process everything. I know your natural curiosity will kick in between now and then, and you'll be ready to tear this case apart. I gaze through the windshield. I sure hope you're right. I know I'm right. It always happens that way. You won't be able to stay out of it. He gets out and opens my door for me. I step onto the sidewalk, but I still feel depressed and drained. That's what comes of finding a woman dead in her living room. I bow my head and screw my toe into the pavement. Thanks. Sure. He kisses me on the forehead. Take it easy on yourself today. I'll see you later. He gets in his car and drives off. Now I'm all alone. I'm not alone alone. I'm in the middle of town. Zack works behind the candy counter. All I have to do is walk in there and I'll have someone to talk to. But I'm alone with this. Alone with the oppressive fact of Florence's murder. What's the use of living to 95 in good health if someone is just going to come along and kill you? What's the use in being inspired by Florence and hoping I can maybe do half of what she did, if that's what I have to look forward to? I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want anybody trying to make me feel better. I want to keep feeling sorry for myself, maybe forever. I make up my mind to go home and get back into my pajamas, 
when I notice a flashing light over at the ice cream parlor. I spot Cedric behind the window. He's intent on setting up a flashing neon sign, ice cream. Sparkling bulbs ripple around the words and make it an eye-catching attraction anybody can see from a long way away. The sight immediately causes a reaction in me. My attitude flips like a switch. All the excitement and optimism I felt for my promotion floods back. I square my shoulders and stride across the street. He sees me halfway there and meets me at the door with a big smile on his face. Margaret, how wonderful of you to stop by. We were hoping you weren't too traumatized by Mrs. Smith's death to continue with our promotion idea. Not at all, I reply. It's just what I need to get back into life. We were going to talk about ice cream flavors, weren't we? I turn toward the cases. They hum with motors running to keep them cold. They already contain vats of every shade of ice cream known to man. Of course, of course. I'll just call Abigail because I know she wanted to be a part of this. He hustles to the back door and bellows through it. Abigail! Margaret Nichols is here! Abigail rushes in and seizes my hand. She pumps it up and down like I'm the answer to all her secret prayers. You made it, Margaret. I'm so pleased. Shall we get started? I know you'll want chocolate and vanilla. Everybody wants those. What else would you like? I know you had flavor ideas of your own. I do, I reply. And I was thinking to make them up with additional ingredients like fruit and nuts and caramel and stuff like that. That's a good idea, she tells me. But what about something a little more out there? What do you mean? She strolls down the cases, pointing at the tubs, one after the other. Well, there's Rocky Road. That's always a winner. There's various flavors of coffee and toffee and praline. People love those. My eyes snap open. Coffee! I didn't think of that! That opens up a whole new range of possibilities. Cedric holds up his hand. Now just hold your horses, old girl. You don't want to overcomplicate this thing too much. Remember, it's just going to be the three of us making these shakes and serving them. Besides, we won't have much space to house too many containers of ice cream. His comments bring me down to earth real fast. You're right. Let's talk about that. How are we going to keep the ice cream cold during the promotion? How about we set up one of the freezers out on the sidewalk? Abigail waves her arms across the front window. We can have three flavors of ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, and coffee. Your additives don't need refrigeration, do they? If they do, we can put them in the case with the tubs. She snaps her fingers and points at me. Excellent. The rest we can set up on the tables along with a cash box and ATM machine. We can run all the extension cords from here, or from your candy store. I don't know. Which side of the street did you plan to set it up on? I... I don't know. I look back and forth between the two of them. Does it really matter? Cedric shrugs. Well, whichever side we use, it will look like that is the store that is doing the promotion. It will bring more business to that store, and the other might look like it's being left out in the cold. Not necessarily, I point out. If we set it up on my side of the street, we could put up a big sign that says Old Time Ice Cream Parlor to let everyone know that you're doing the promotion, too. Abigail's eyes pop. And you can offer your candies as ingredients to put in the shakes. You can offer Skittles and Reese's Pieces and M&Ms and... I burst out laughing. If I do that, the sky is the limit on what flavors we can offer. People can mix and match their ingredients. Perfect. 
Abigail clasps her hands and beams at me. I'm so looking forward to this. I'm, uh... I fidget again. I'm testing out my shake recipes in the meantime, but I need some ice cream to do it with. Would you mind letting me borrow a few tubs just to get the ball rolling? Not at all. Cedric crosses to his cases and opens the lid. You can take a chocolate and vanilla one right now if you like. I look over my shoulder at the candy store. I do a quick mental calculation on where I'm going to keep all this ice cream. Okay, I can put them in the freezer over at the store. He hefts a tub out and deposits it in my arms. Right away, it numbs my muscles and sends shivers down my spine. I have to get rid of this thing pronto. He starts to take the next tub out. Hold it, I tell him. Just wait until I drop this off and I'll come back for the second one. I stagger across the street to the candy store. Zack's eyes widen when I barge in carrying a tub of ice cream. I make my way to the storeroom and finagle the thing into the freezer, but it takes up all the space. I won't be able to fit another one in there. I traipse back to the ice cream parlor. Sorry, I tell Cedric. I don't have freezer space for another one. I'll get started with this and come back for the other when I've used it up. Good deal. He escorts me to the door. Let me know if you need any tips or help gearing up for the big event. Instead of going back to the store, I go home and get my blender. I take it back to town and set up on the work table near my office. I mix up several different varieties of shake, and I'm ashamed to admit that I sampled each and every one. I finish and put what's left of the chocolate ice cream in the freezer. When I get the work table wiped down and the blender washed, I glance at the clock and nearly lose my lunch. It's six o'clock. Zack is long gone and the store is locked. How did all that time pass without me noticing? Zack must have checked, and when noticed me deep in my milkshake flow, he locked up and went home without me. I sigh and put the rest of my stuff away. At least I have the chocolate side of things worked out. I let myself out of the back door and lock it with my key before walking home. The house beams golden light into the street. It sends out its homing beacons to draw me into its warmth. There really is no place like home. A palpable wave of relief hits me when I let myself into the house and shut the door behind me. I freeze, though, when I hear high-pitched laughter coming from the living room. I peek in to see Zack, Gilly, and Ariel sitting around playing Candyland on the coffee table. I gasp. What's going on here? Zack looks up. Hey, Mom, don't tell me you spoiled your dinner with all those chocolate milkshakes. Gilly and Ariel laugh. I frown at Ariel. What are you doing here on a school night? Does your dad know where you are? Ariel bites back a smirk. It's not a school night, Margaret. It's Friday. I blink. It is? I invited Ariel and Detective Graham over for dinner, Mom. Zack adds. He had to work late on some case. He said he'd be here around 6.30, which is in ten minutes. I gawk at him. You invited them for dinner? His eyes dart to one side, and he snorts with laughter. Yeah, can you think of any reason why I shouldn't have? My shoulders sag. I guess not. Good, he replies. Because Ariel is staying overnight, too. Gilly and I are taking her to Comic-Con in Hartford tomorrow morning. And before you ask, yes, I have her dad's permission, both for her to stay over and to take her, so don't even ask. I can't stop staring at the three of them. 
While Zack talks, Gilly rolls the die and moves her green marker a few more spaces. Ariel snickers at some secret joke. I sidle into the room and sink into a chair. Well, I guess that's settled then. A knock on the front door answers me. Zack jumps up. I'll get it. He lets David in. He nods to the company and takes a chair. What's the word, Thunderbird? I'm winning, Ariel announces. She's cheating, Zack grumbles. Now that I'm sitting down, the day's work starts to catch up with me. I don't feel so hot. I told you you'd spoil your dinner, Zack retorts. You must have drunk five gallons of chocolate milkshake. Now you won't enjoy the lamb chops I made you. I guess I got a little overly enthusiastic. David laughs. So what else is new? I'm sorry, sweetheart, I tell Zack. I didn't know you went to all the trouble of making dinner and inviting people over. I wasn't thinking. I know you weren't, he replies. The last time I looked in on you, you were up to your eyebrows in chocolate. At that moment, Ariel explodes upward. She pumps both fists in the air. Woohoo! I won! I won! She leaps to her feet and starts doing a victory dance around the living room. Bow down! Bow down to the champion! I'm the greatest! Oh yeah! David chuckles. Easy, honey bunch. You'll knock over the lamp doing that. Gilly starts putting away the board. It's dinner time anyway. Zack stands up. I'll get the food on the table if you people care to adjourn to the dining room. Ariel gets herself under control and follows Zack out of the room. Gilly takes the game box to the hall to stash it in the closet. I stay where I am for a minute, but when the time comes for me to stand up, I groan. Now my stomach really hurts. David appears at my side. Here, lean on me. I manage to stand, but I have to bend over to accommodate my aching gut. Remind me not to drink more than a few sips of a milkshake again. You did it for the cause, so you're to be congratulated. He supports my arm while I limp toward the door. You don't have to take care of me, I mutter. I'm sure you have your hands full with the case right now. He hesitates. When he answers, he keeps his voice low. Let's not talk about the case right now. I steal a peek up at his face. Is it serious? His eyes twinkle down at me. I told you you'd be back into it in no time. He gives me a quick peck on the lips. We can talk about it tomorrow. For now, let's just enjoy the time with our family. I don't say anything else while he escorts me to the dining room table. He steers me to my seat and I sit down, but I don't eat dinner with the rest of them. It looks delicious, but I can't stand the thought of food right now. He said our family, and he's right. We're all like family now. Zack and Gilly, me and David and Ariel. They're in and out of this house like they own it. David and Ariel are always coming over for dinner. I'm sure that this is only the first of many times Ariel will spend the night here. I catch David smiling at me from the chair next to me. When our eyes meet, he slides his hand across the tablecloth to clasp mine. His warm fingers make me feel even more comfortable and at home than ever. I don't know what my life in West End would be like if I didn't have him in it, and now I can't imagine life without Ariel either. My life was bereft and bare without them. I hope I never lose them. Chapter 7 
I knock on the glass door and let myself into the police station. David sits behind his desk and leans back from the computer when I enter. All righty then, let's get cracking, shall we? I sit down in the chair across the desk. Did you get the results back from the forensics tests? Yep. He picks up a file folder. They didn't get any prints from the tire iron, and it is Florence's blood, so no surprises there. The M.E. puts the time of death between 7 o'clock in the evening and midnight. My eyes widen. Midnight? As in the night before? Yeah. The report lists the fact that rigor mortis had affected all the major muscle groups of the body, which puts the time of death at least 12 hours before when she was found. He flips the pages and scans the report. You found her at 11.30 the following morning, hence the conclusion. I make a face. I don't think I want to hear about when rigor mortis set in. He shuts the file. If you're going to be a P.I. for hire, you better start getting used to it. These are common tools used to identify not only the time of death, but a lot of other important characteristics of a murder. Such as? I ask. Such as whether the body was moved after the person died. If rigor mortis sets in with the body in an unusual shape, you can guess someone moved the body before it went rigid. I groan. Great. There are also Alger Mortis and Liver Mortis, the three Mortis brothers, as my old training officer called them. Alger Mortis is pooling of the blood. The minute the heart stops pumping, gravity draws the blood toward the earth. So you find what looks like bruises on a body. They appear on the buttocks and the shoulder blades, if the person is lying on their back, for instance. Depending on where you find the dark patches, you can determine if the body was moved after the person died. And liver mortis? I ask. What does that mean? That refers to cooling of the body. The forensics team takes a temperature reading on the body when it's found. This can be used to help determine the time of death, though it's not totally accurate. In cool or refrigerated conditions, a body can cool down quicker. I grimace in spite of myself. Maybe I'm not cut out to be a P.I. after all. If the lecture is over, can we get back to talking about Florence? Sure. You say her daughter had a motive, so we can go talk to her. Don't forget the Johnsons, I remind him. I haven't forgotten them. You can come with me to question them, too, since you know them. I wiggle in my chair. About that. He looks up. Yes? Maybe I shouldn't help you question the Johnsons. Why not? He asks. You've met them. You have an established relationship with them. That makes you the best person to question them. That's what I mean, I explain. I'm supposed to be going into business with them. I'm doing a promotion with them. Maybe it won't work for me to investigate them for murder at the same time. I don't want this to sour our working relationship, and I don't want it to taint the investigation either. It never tainted it in the past, he points out. You questioned Kathy Nielsen about Peter Dugan's death while you were working with her. I know. I just wanted to bring it up in case you, you know, in case you thought I might have a conflict of interest or something. He stands up and moves around his desk. I don't think you have a conflict of interest. I want you to help me on this case, and I don't think your professional relationship with the Johnsons will interfere at all. And you'll let me know if you think it is a problem? You promise you'll let me know? I promise. We get into his car, and he starts driving toward town. I don't suppose the Johnsons are working in their ice cream parlor on a Saturday. I wouldn't be so sure, I remark. The last time I was in there, they had all their display cases full of ice cream. 
I wouldn't be surprised if they open in the next week. Let's cruise down Main Street and take a look. He purrs through town, and we both crane our necks, peering into the ice cream parlor. The lights are out, and nobody's home. They're staying at the Overlook Hotel until they buy a house, I tell him. In that case, let's stop by Betty's first. Her house is on the way. He steers to the other side of West End. He enters the warren of streets extending into the woods. He stops in front of a small house set about with neatly pruned rose bushes. We get out and approach the door. David knocks, and an older woman with her temples going gray answers it. She frowns when David flashes his badge. Good morning, Betty. We're here to ask you a few questions about your mother's murder. She rolls her eyes and smacks her lips. If you have to. She rotates on her heel and storms off into the house without inviting us in. David shoots me a meaningful glance and steps across the threshold. We locate Betty in an airy sunroom behind the house. Hundreds of plants pack the shelves and tables clustering the room. She works over a plant, pulling off the dead leaves and old flower buds. She scratches debris from around its roots and sprinkles fresh peat moss in place. Then she waters it and sets it aside before taking up another one. David clears his throat. Can you tell us anything that might shed any light on your mother's death? Do you know of anyone who might have wanted to hurt her? Any enemies she might have had? Betty doesn't look up. My mother didn't have any enemies. Everyone in this town loved her. She just didn't get out much. As she got older, she spent more time in her house. Yeah, about that. David shrugs inside his jacket. We hear you wanted to sell the house without her permission. Is that true? The question produces a lightning effect on Betty. She wheels around and glares at him. I didn't kill her, if that's what you're trying to imply. I'm not trying to imply anything, David breezes. I simply asked if it's true that you tried to sell the house without her permission. Of course it's true, she snapped. Everybody knows it's true since the Johnsons moved to town and the whole thing fell apart. I have no reason to lie about it. I see the conversation deteriorating rapidly, so I take the opportunity to do my community liaison act. Can you help us understand why you put your mother's house on the market without her consent when you knew she didn't want to sell it? She throws up her hands with an exasperated gasp. She swivels all the way around to confront us. It isn't as sinister as you make it out. I thought if I got a decent offer on it and I showed her how much she stood to get from it, that she would change her tune. It didn't play out that way. She got all offended that I went behind her back, and then the Johnsons decided to play hardball with their lawyer and everyone by expecting me to fulfill the contract for the sale. The whole thing blew up in my face. That's all. It's complicated, Betty. David adds. It looks an awful lot like you wanted to get rid of your mother so you could get your hands on her money by selling the house. Of everyone, you stood to gain the most when she died. Well, I didn't kill her. She jerks around the other way and lays into her plants with a vengeance. She makes her voice hard and cruel, but as soon as she turns her back to us... Her shoulders start shaking. She holds herself stiff and tense, trying to bury the sobs. My heart sinks looking at her. She's really torn up by her mother's death. Or at least she pretends to be. Those racking sobs sure seem real to me, though. I catch David stealing another glance at me. 
That's my cue. I'm so sorry for your loss, Betty, but we need to ask you just one more question. Where were you the night before she died? She crunches her chin into her chest and growls in a gravelly undertone that cracks with suppressed emotion. I was here all night. I never left. David nods toward the door. I touch Betty's arm one last time. You have our deepest sympathies, Betty. We'll let ourselves out. Back in the car, we sit quietly and survey the house. Well, that explains why she listed the house, I begin. It was all a colossal misunderstanding. Tell it to the judge, David counters. She doesn't have an alibi. She lives alone, so no one can confirm that she really was here all night. She sure seems broken up over her mother's death, I remark. Either that, or she's one outstanding actress. It's been known to happen. The problem is, if she didn't kill her mother, she'll inherit the house, which means she'll be able to sell it exactly the way she planned. She'll benefit from her mother's death, even if she didn't do it. Isn't that always the case? I return. Inheritance is always a double-edged sword. A lot of people feel guilty inheriting money from their parents because they'd rather have their parents alive. They can't enjoy the benefit because the cost is too high. Maybe you're right, he admits. I know a lot of people who change their attitudes toward their parents after their parents die. They don't appreciate their parents until they're not around anymore. Maybe Betty will change her attitude toward Florence now that Florence isn't around for Betty to hate her, I suggest. We can only hope. He starts the motor. Let's go out to the Overlook and see what the Johnsons have to say for themselves. I fall into a pensive trance on the way to the beach. I gaze at the waves crashing against the sand. What the tarnation am I doing with my life? If I want to end up like Florence, hale and hearty at the age of 95, I mean, not murdered in my own home, I'm not exactly on the path to getting there. I'm stressing about the store and this promotion and solving murders and organizing community events and a whole lot of other stuff. I don't spend near enough time just enjoying the simple pleasures I neglect my garden and my health. I work way too hard and put in way too many hours on too many projects. I'll drop from a heart attack long before I get to 95. David startles me by switching off the motor. I think you better tell me what's on your mind before your ears burst into flame. I have to laugh. Sorry, I've been thinking about stuff. Obviously. Now tell me what stuff you've been thinking about. I was thinking about Florence. I sneak a peek at him. Don't you ever wonder where your life is heading? Don't you ever wonder where you'll end up if you keep going the way you are now? Yeah, I think about that all the time. He studies at me with a weighty, significant stare. The intensity of his gaze makes me nervous. I look away toward the ocean. I keep thinking I want to be like Florence. I want to be strong and able and independent and frisky at the age of 95. But if I do that, I would have to give up so much that means a lot to me. Like what? He asks. What would you have to give up if you want to be all those things? Well, the store, for one thing. I would have to give up sleuthing and all these promotions and community events and all that stuff. I would have to... Well, I would basically have to become a hermit in my own house. Who says? He counters. Besides, 
Who says that being strong and able and independent and frisky at the age of 95 is such a good thing anyway? Isn't the whole point of life to get as much out of it as you can in the time you have? I shrug. I guess so. Listen to me. He twists around to face me. Let's say you retired from the store and sleuthing and community events and whatever else. Let's say you turned into a total homebody and puttered around your garden and stacked your own firewood and canned your own apple pie filling and all the other stuff Florence did. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Would you be happy with that life? No, I wouldn't, I reply. I would think I was missing out on something. That's why I'm confused about what I should be doing. He snaps his fingers. Exactly. You wouldn't be happy, and you wouldn't be doing the best you could do for the people around you, which, if I know anything about you at all, is one of the major things that makes life worth living to you, isn't it? Yeah. So what's the point of living to 95 with all your health and vitality intact if you're doing something that makes you miserable? Wouldn't you rather live to 65 if it meant you could be 10 times happier and make a million more people happy in the process? I dare to look up at him. Yeah, you're right. Of course I am. You're happy sleuthing and keeping your store and organizing everyone else's lives. That's what makes your time on planet Earth worthwhile, so that's what you should do. You might live to be 95, or you might live another three years. Either way, you're enjoying life and making a difference, and that's what counts. I brighten up at this pep talk. Thanks. Now, can we go question the suspects? I laugh with relief. Yeah. We walk into the overlook and inquire at the desk to find out the Johnson's room number. When we knock on the door, Cedric's eyes widen at the sight of David's badge. Is there a problem, officer? I'm Detective David Graham of the Peterborough Police Department. I'm the officer in charge of Florence Smith's murder investigation. I hope you understand why we have to question you about this. You had an interest in purchasing her home. That gives you a motive to murder her. Cedric arches his brow at me. We? I'm just helping out the investigation, I tell him. I'm acting as a kind of unofficial community liaison between the people of West End and the police department. I've worked on several murder investigations with Detective Graham before. This has nothing to do with our promotion, Cedric, and I hope it won't interfere with our professional relationship in the future. He scowls. Oh, all right then. He enters his room, and we find Abigail seated by the window. What's this all about? We just need to ask you both some questions about Florence Smith's murder, I tell her. Can you tell us where you both were between seven o'clock and midnight the night before she was killed? The couple exchange glances. We were both here, Cedric replies. We spent the whole night here, and we never left. What were you doing? David asks. We were sleeping, Cedric fires back. Isn't that what married couples do at night? And you were together the whole time? I ask. There's no chance either of you could have slipped out? He cocks his head to think back. I went downstairs for a minute to get the paper. That would have been about 9.30, but I was only gone for five minutes at the most, and the desk clerk can confirm I was there. Then I came back up here. We read for a little while, and then we went to sleep. Can you tell us a little more about your litigation with Betty Smith? I ask. I wouldn't call it litigation, Abigail chimes in. We are going to mediation first, 
If that doesn't work, we'll take it further. Betty claims this is all a misunderstanding, I continue. She says she only listed the house to show her mother how much she could get for it. She never expected you to enforce the sale. Then she shouldn't have signed a legally binding contract, Cedric snaps. It wasn't legally binding because she didn't have the legal right to sign it, David points out. That makes it null and void. What do you hope to gain by taking it to mediation? The two of them glance at each other again. Well, that was before Florence wound up dead. If one of you killed her, David remarks, then Betty would inherit the house. That would put you in a perfect position to negotiate with her to buy it after all. That's a pretty powerful motive to kill Florence. Cedric swells out his shoulders and puffs his cheeks. We didn't kill her. If I had known she felt so strongly about keeping her house, I never would have wanted to buy it in the first place. Then why don't you drop the litigation? I mean, mediation? I ask. You know now. Why didn't you just drop it the instant you found out Florence didn't want to sell? It's the financial outlay, Abigail tells me. It cost us $10,000 in agent fees to secure the offer. Now we're out of pocket to stay in this hotel until we find a house to buy, plus storage for all our possessions. We're only going to mediation to try to get Betty to compensate us, since it was her mistake. Our suit is against Betty, not Florence. I see. We were both horrified when we found out, Cedric goes on. We never wanted to drive some old lady out of her house. That would be terrible. We never met her, but we understand she was a very nice lady. She was. I reply. We're not monsters, you know, Cedric snaps. You have to believe that. We didn't come to West End to make life difficult for the people who already live here. We just want what's fair. I understand. I think we've heard enough for now. Thank you for your time. David and I move toward the door when Cedric grabs my arm. I hope this doesn't mean we can't go ahead with the promotion, Margaret. Not at all, I tell him. The two things aren't related at all. We're definitely still on. He sighs in relief. Abigail watches from her chair while her husband ushers me and David out. She observes us with a detached expression on her face. I can't make out what she's thinking. What did you think of that? David asks when we get into the car. I think Cedric feels a lot more strongly about this situation than Abigail does. He rubs his chin. Hmm, I noticed that too, but I don't know what it means. She didn't seem all that horrified to find out that Florence got killed. She also didn't seem adamant that they wouldn't take the house against Florence's wishes. I point out. He was adamant about it. She seemed tepid on the subject. My thoughts exactly. She also seemed tepid on the subject of buying the house now that Florence is dead. I look over at him. You don't think she killed Florence to get the house, do you? I'm just saying he made it pretty clear he would never push Florence out of her house. But she didn't say that. She didn't even agree when he said it. They both have an alibi, I point out. Neither of them could have done it. Right. He starts the motor. That leaves us with Betty. What do you want to do about her? I ask on the way back. If she did it, we need evidence to make an arrest. Let's tail her tomorrow. I have to work tomorrow. I tell him. I'm free on Monday, though. Monday it is. I could stop by Betty's house, I suggest. I could just make it a social call and take a look around. He shakes his head. Oh, no, you don't. Don't even think about it. 
Why not? I ask. It's just making a call on someone who lost her mother. Don't do it, he counters. Whatever you think you're going to find in her house would be inadmissible as evidence anyway, and she might get her dander up if she thinks you're invading her privacy. But I could find out things the police can't, I point out. What better way to get the evidence we need to arrest her? He clucks his tongue. Did you hear what I just said? Even if you found the smoking gun in her house, we couldn't use it to arrest her. The first time it came up in court, it would get thrown out for illegal search and seizure. Betty would be released, and we'd be right back to square one. I'm telling you not to do it. My mouth says, All right. But my mind won't accept it. I still want to get inside Betty's house and see what I can find. Chapter 8 When I get to work the next morning, I set up my blender on the candy store counter. I mix up chocolate shakes and offer a paper cup to every customer who walks in. They rant and rave about how delicious they are. I'm feeling pretty good about myself now. After Zack and Ariel leave sipping their shakes, I start scheming again. If these samples go over so well, I should do another, bigger trial run next weekend. These small trials will be the best promotion for my promotion. I'm deep in my plans when I happen to glance up and see Betty Smith passing beyond my store window. That snaps me back to thinking about the case. Why shouldn't I go visit her? It's just a visit. I won't do anything to mess up the investigation. I just want to take a look around. I manage to keep myself out of trouble for the rest of the day. After I pack up and lock the store, I pinch another decorative box of chocolates and turn southeast instead of going home. I make my way to Betty's house. My heart pounds in my throat, waiting for her to answer the door. She frowns when she opens it. What do you want? I hold out the box. I brought you some chocolates just to express my condolences on the loss of your mother. She glares at the box and humphs. How are you doing? I hear myself babbling. Is that my guilty conscience talking? I know it's hard to keep going when you lose someone you love. She narrows her eyes. How would you know that? Well, I don't, really, I stammer. Both my parents are still alive, but I've seen a lot of friends go through it. If you're having any trouble managing household tasks, I'm sure the community would pitch in to help out. Everybody's talking about Florence. We all loved her. She glares even more fiercely. I'm not having any trouble managing household tasks, thank you very much. I'm fine, and I don't need chocolate to make me feel better. Oh. I wilt like a deflated balloon. Well, do you want company? It's gotta get lonely living by yourself. It's not lonely. She snaps. I like it. It's quiet. My shoulders droop. Well, do you want me to go? She softens, but she doesn't lose that dreadful scowl. Oh, all right. I guess you can come in. She stomps off, and I hurry after her. She tears the box open on her way to a galley kitchen set in another part of the house. Boxes and packing crates line the corridors. Boxes slouch unopened on the bookshelves. They pile in front of the couch where a coffee table ought to be. She enters the kitchen, sits down at the table, and starts plowing into the chocolate like there's no tomorrow. I cast a wary glance around. How long have you lived in this house? Almost ten years, she mumbles between bites. My uncle left it to me. I was the only descendant, so I got it. 
I nod, more to myself than to her. She's been living here for ten years and still hasn't unpacked. She's probably been spending too much time working on her plants. She inhales the whole box of chocolate in one sitting. She doesn't offer me any or even look sideways at me, even when I'm standing right in front of her. As soon as she finishes, she dumps the box in the trash and heads for her sunroom. It's dark in there now, but a single bare bulb overhead gives enough light to see. She walks to the same spot and starts working the same as yesterday. Does she ever quit? Is this the sum total of her life? She presents such a stark contrast to her mother. No wonder she hated Florence. Florence must have been a constant reminder of what Betty could never be. She doesn't make any attempt to engage me in conversation. She appears to have forgotten my existence. My heart leaps. This is my chance to search her house for clues. David's warning goes right out of my head. I stroll toward the kitchen. Dirty dishes pile in the sink. A bunch of greasy old pizza boxes form a leaning cardboard tower on the counter. This woman really has let her whole life slide. Maybe she's depressed. At the end of the kitchen, a pocket door communicates with a laundry room. A mountain of laundry slumps in front of the washing machine. Detergent scatters around the box. Most of the bottles of fabric softener and cleaners drip down their sides to form puddles underneath. I cringe at the sight. I couldn't live like this. The sheer filth and disorganization would drive me bonkers. Just then, I spot a gardening glove in the laundry sink. A black stain across the fingers looks something like blood. I check outside. Betty hasn't moved from her workbench. She doesn't see me. I can grab that glove. If the blood matches Florence's, this could be the evidence we need that Betty killed her mother. My fingers itch to grab the glove, but I hesitate. I have to be careful not to contaminate the evidence. I glance around. I need a way to transport it that won't prevent the lab identifying and typing the blood. My blood runs cold and sticky sweat breaks out all over me. This could be it. This could be the crucial piece of evidence to solve Florence Smith's murder. I can't leave it behind. I saunter down the kitchen, rummaging in my brain for what to do. I get to the far end. Betty slaves over her plants. She probably never does anything else. When I get ready to return to the laundry to seize my ill-gotten prize, my eye comes to rest on a low drawer near my knees. A plastic bag sticks out. It's a Ziploc. I catch my breath. It's perfect! That's exactly what I need! I bend down and make sure my head is below counter level. When I slide the drawer open, my spirits soar all over again. An open box of Ziplocs disgorges a dozen bags at me. They just scream for me to take one. I snatch a bag and stand up. I keep casting furtive glances backward to make sure Betty doesn't see me. I hold the Ziploc behind me, scurrying to the laundry room. When I get there, I unzip the bag and spread it open. I use the inner bag lining to pick up the glove without touching it. I maneuver it inside and zip it closed. Yay! I did it! I stuff the bagged glove in my pocket and beat it out of there without saying anything to Betty. My heart hurts from pounding against my ribs. I can't breathe, but I'm free. I race back to town all the way to my house. I'm feeling mighty pleased with myself when I take the glove upstairs and get ready for bed. Monday morning dawns, 
I'm walking on air, waiting for David to pick me up. I place the glove next to the door, all ready to present him with my treasure. He shows up at the stroke of nine and escorts me to his car. I work overtime to contain my excitement until he gets in the driver's seat next to me. Then I whip out the glove, flip around, and hold it out to him. Ta-da! He stares at the bag. What's this? It's one of Betty's gardening gloves. I found it at her house, and it's got a blood stain on it. It could be Florence's. He blinks at me. Are you telling me you went to see Betty after I specifically told you not to? I'm the community liaison officer, aren't I? I took her a box of chocolates along with my condolences on the loss of her mother. It was the perfect pretext to get into her house. He snaps out of his trance. That's exactly right. It was a pretext. You didn't go there to offer your condolences. You went there to search her house. It was a ruse, and that makes it wrong, Margaret. Yeah, but now we have this glove. You can match the blood to the tire iron. You can determine if Betty killed Florence. He shakes his head and glares out the window. How many times do I have to tell you? We can't use this evidence. Even if it is Florence's blood, the evidence was obtained illegally. That makes it inadmissible, which, in case you haven't been paying attention, is a nice way of saying it's useless. We can't use it. We can't even use it to suspect Betty. The bag starts to weigh too much in my hand. He won't even touch it. Aren't you at least going to check? He purses his lips and shoots daggers at me. Do you know what this is, Margaret? I frown. What is it? This is what we call theft. You stole that glove from Betty's house. You entered a woman's house for all the wrong reasons, and you took something that didn't belong to you. You took something for no good reason at all. Not only does this not help us solve the case, it actually makes us less likely to solve it. Now his words start to sink home. I let the glove fall on the seat. You don't have to be mean about it. He lowers his voice to a murmur. I'm disappointed in you, Margaret. This really doesn't comport with your do-gooder personality at all. You're supposed to be making the world a better place, not turning to crime yourself. We don't do that. You don't do that. You've never done it in all the time I've known you, and I don't want to see you doing it now. I hang my head. Now that he puts it like that, I realize how wrong it was to take the glove. I'm sorry. He snatches up the bag and tosses it under the seat like so much trash. Then he takes my hand and crushes it in his big paw. I understand you meant well, but this is turning to the wrong side of the law. The ends never justify the means, Margaret. That's the way criminals think. You can't start thinking like that, and you always, always have to stay on the right side of the law. That's the only thing that separates us from them. Never forget that. I stare down at my hand in his, and a lump sticks in my throat. How could I make such a monstrous screw-up? Will he ever forgive me? He lets go of my hand, cups his fingers behind my neck, and kisses me on the forehead. Then he grabs the key and turns the ignition. Come on, we're late for a stakeout. Chapter 9 I yawn and recline back against the seat. How long is this going to take? As long as it takes. David scans Betty's house through his binoculars. She's still in the sunroom. She's been there all morning. Do we really have to sit here all day? I moan. 
Isn't there anything we can do? Anything at all? You can play Tetris on your phone for all I care. I'll keep an eye on her. I groan and roll my eyes. This is the most boring neighborhood in the world. What was I thinking agreeing to this stakeout? I'm really not cut out for sleuthing. When am I going to realize that? I'm just about to get out my phone, like he says, when he sits up straight in his seat. Hello, she's on the move. What? I blink the dust out of my eyes. Where? I don't have to ask. Betty comes out of her house and gets in her car. She drives toward town. David crawls after her at a safe distance, and we watch her park in front of the happy-go-lucky cafe. What's she doing? I whisper. She's going inside. Oh, look, the Johnsons are here, too. No! I gasp. What if they're meeting her? We don't know that. It could just be a coincidence. How could it be? I ask. Who goes to a cafe at 10.30 on a Monday morning? They must be meeting her. Now don't jump to conclusions, he tells me. Just because they're... I grab the door handle. I'm going in there. He shoots out a hand to grab me. You can't. You'll tip them off. If it's just a coincidence that they all came here at 10.30 in the morning, then it's just a coincidence that I came here at 10.30 in the morning. This is our best chance to find out what they're up to, and if they've got something going with Betty on the side. For all we know, all three of them plotted to kill Florence. He scowls at me. You better be careful. I'll text you if anything happens. I hop out of the car and race for the cafe. When I get to the front counter, I spot Betty sitting down at a booth with the Johnsons. My heart leaps. This is too good to be true, so they do have something going on the side. Stacy scurries over. What can I do for you? I'll just have a cup of coffee. Could I have that table over there? I point to the spot adjacent to their booth. A large indoor rubber tree hides the two tables from each other. I eased into my place and cuddled my coffee cup when Betty's voice comes to me from behind the rubber tree. We had a deal. You can't back out on it now. You're the one who ruined the deal, Betty, Cedric fires back. You screwed us over by listing a house that wasn't for sale. You cost us a lot of money. Now you have to pay it back. I don't have to pay it back if you buy the house, she replies. Now that my mother is dead, you can buy it the way you planned. Everything worked out in the end. You call this working out? He snaps. We don't want the house now. You lied to us. We can't trust you. I could never do business with someone so underhanded. Well, what are you going to do? Betty's voice rises. Now I've got this old house on my hands and no way to sell it. That's your problem, not ours, Cedric grumbles. We'll just have to find another house to buy, and if you don't pay us back for the money you cost us... Will take you to court and force you to pay. A choking noise comes from behind me. The next minute, Betty rushes out of the cafe. A few moments of silence follow. This definitely sounds like the three of them were in league with each other, but so far, none of them has said anything to indicate which of them killed Florence. In fact, so far, the conversation has played out the same way as if none of them killed her. I send a quick text to David. Betty is leaving, but the Johnsons are still here. Send. I can follow her, but what about you? I can get Zack to pick me up. Don't lose Betty. She might lead you to some other incriminating clue. Send.
Abigail speaks up. Are you sure you aren't being a bit too hasty, dear? What do you mean? Cedric asks. She tried to sell that house out from under her own mother, and now the old lady is dead. I don't want to live in a house that was gotten by underhanded means. She's a leech. I won't have anything to do with her. We might get it cheaper now. No one will want a house where the previous owner was murdered. Betty will want to get rid of it at any cost. How can you even think that, Abigail? Cedric gasps. I couldn't live in a house where the previous owner was murdered, especially since she was murdered because of our purchase agreement. I mean, really, Abigail, who wants to live in a house where you have to see a big blood stain on the living room carpet? She keeps her voice to a low murmur. Carpet can be replaced. It's a nice house. Why shouldn't we buy it if we can? My skin crawls listening to this. How can anyone be so heartless? Then again, she just wants to buy the house. She probably got her heart set on it when Betty accepted their offer. Why shouldn't she get it if the previous owner isn't around to object anymore? The Johnsons mutter to each other a little longer, and coins jingle on the table. Then they walk out. I stay where I am and sip my coffee while I text Zack to ask him to pick me up. The sad part is, I'm no closer to breaking this case. None of the players said anything we didn't already know. Abigail Johnson is a cold-hearted, money-grubbing hound. Other than that, I'm none the wiser about who killed Florence. I check my phone. The Johnsons left ten minutes ago. I guess there's nothing stopping me from getting on with the rest of my day, too. I wander to the counter and pay for my coffee. Then I go outside to wait for Zack to show up. I blink into the sunshine. The weather is warming up now, and the heat feels good. My eyes sting with the brilliant rays shining in through my eyelids. I let myself start to relax. I can let the rest of the day go without thinking about the case, at least until I meet up with David again. I let out a sigh. Life is good. The moment that thought crosses my mind, a blinding thunk pierces my brain. Shattering pain grips me around the eyes, and a black veil drapes across my sight. For a terrible instant, the world teeters on its axis. I don't know if I'm up or down. I struggle to hold my reality together, but I can't move. The next thing I know, I'm falling, falling, falling into the deepest hole where reality doesn't exist anymore. In a fraction of a second, someone shakes me by the shoulder. Are you okay, Mom? I blink and stare up at Zack leaning over me. I have to think hard before I figure out where I am. I'm lying flat on my back outside the happy-go-lucky cafe instead of sitting on the wall nearby. Zack eases me into a sitting position. What happened, Mom? My hand flies to my splitting temple. I'm... I'm not sure. I think someone must have hit me over the head. Not again, he breathes. The detective is going to be furious. I rub my cranium, but I find it hard to open my eyes. My head hurts a lot more than I want to admit. I'm all right. Just, just help me stand up. Not on your life, Mom, he fires back. I'm taking you to the hospital. Come on, get in my car. I don't need to go to the hospital. Even as I say those words, my knees wobble and a wave of nausea seizes me. Zack has to support me just to keep me upright. 
Just take me home. I'll be fine. Are you out of your mind? He retorts. I would never be able to look the detective in the eye if I didn't take you in. He's been hounding you for ages to get a brain scan, and now you're going to get one. I start to protest again, but he cuts me off. I'll text him now so he knows what's going on. That clinches it. I can't win. Zack helps me into the passenger seat, and I bow my throbbing head while he texts David. With the two of them working together, they can browbeat me into anything. He gets into the driver's seat and puts his phone away. He's going to meet us there. I see defeat crushes over my spirit. I stick my hands in my pockets, trying to warm up. When I do, I feel a scrap of paper in my pocket. I take it out and unfold it. What's that? Zack asks. I read it. Stay away from Florence Smith's murder if you know what's good for you. I wad up the paper and stuff it back in my pocket. It's nothing. I cower in the seat with my eyes closed while Zack drives me down to Peterborough. When we arrive at the hospital, it takes all my strength to walk into the waiting room. Then I close my eyes again. I can't look at or talk to anyone. Zack handles the paperwork and the reception team for me. Then he sits down in the next chair to wait as long as it takes. Maybe he and David are right. Maybe all these head injuries are finally catching up with me. What if there really is something wrong with me? I might have to give up sleuthing altogether. The wear and tear is just too much. That wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen to me, now that I think about it. I would be able to concentrate more on the things that mean a lot to me. At least I would be able to concentrate on the other things that mean a lot to me. Sleuthing was never my goal in life. It just kind of happened to me. I fell into it by accident. I wouldn't be losing much if I fell out of it the same way. I would just go back to running the store and interfering in other people's lives. David would love me just as much. I'm certain of that. The people I care about most in the world would support me. They would still think I'm the greatest. That wouldn't change. This is the first time in my life I've had people around me, a lot of people, that I knew for certain would love and support me no matter what I did. They would even support me if I gave up the store. I'm not giving up the store. I could give up sleuthing, but I could never walk away from the store. That's solid. I must be suffering from a serious concussion if I'm going through this existential crisis in the ER waiting room. Hey, what do I know? Maybe this happens to everyone while they're waiting for a brain scan. A soft hand touches my shoulder. I squint up to find David sitting down at my side. He gazes deep into my soul. I see all his care and concern written in his eyes. At that moment, a female voice calls out, Margaret? A nurse with a clipboard welcomes me into another room. Zack and David hover nearby. What can we do for you today? Someone hit me over the head. I mumble. This is the eighth time it's happened in the last year, David adds. The nurse's eyes widen, and she takes notes on the clipboard. Well, that's not good, is it? Did you lose consciousness? Yeah, I passed out. How long were you out? She asks. I glance up at Zack. I'm... I'm not sure. I can tell you. He takes out his phone. You texted me to pick you up at ten minutes to eleven o'clock. I found you at quarter after, and you were just waking up. That leaves twenty-five minutes unaccounted for. 
Can you remember how long after you texted Zack that you were waiting outside? David asks. Now I know what murder suspects feel like getting grilled by the police. It must have been about five minutes, no more. Zack turns to the nurse. There you go, about twenty minutes. That's a pretty significant blow, she remarks. All of the other blows caused her to lose consciousness, too, David informs her. I'll tell the doctor that, but I'm pretty sure she'll order a scan as soon as possible. My chin falls on my chest. I was afraid you were going to say that. Hallelujah, David murmurs. Finally. Have you had any other symptoms? The nurse asks. Blurred vision? Delirium? Projectile vomiting? I snicker under my breath. No, nothing. I've felt totally normal, except that my head hurts. She picks up the clipboard. I'll go get the doctor for you. Just sit tight and we'll get this taken care of in no time. Wonderful. Just what I need. She breezes out of the room and leaves us alone. David turns to Zack. I really appreciate you contacting me the way you did. No problem, Zack replies. I know you've been at Mom for ages to get a scan. Now she has no choice. David confronts me. Any clues who might have done this? Without looking up, I hand over the note. I found this in my pocket when I woke up. It definitely wasn't there when I passed out. He scans it. Same old story. This doesn't tell us anything. Did you follow Betty? He nods. She went home, but then I got called away on another errand. She could have gone back to the cafe and done this. I put an unmarked car on her to track her movements, but it wouldn't have gotten to her house until after I got Zack's text. Or the Johnsons could have done it, I point out. All three of them left before me. I didn't think they noticed me listening to their conversation, but I could be wrong about that. Obviously, Zack sneers. I don't respond. I suppose I was conceited to think I could get away with that stunt. One of them must have seen me, or this never would have happened. Anyway, David goes on, whoever hit you must have put the note in your pocket, so I think we can conclude that the killer was one of the three people at that table. Not necessarily, I argue. Take Betty, for instance. She could have hit me in order to deliver the note, but that doesn't necessarily make her the killer. Maybe she just wanted to get me off her back. What about the Johnsons? Zack interjects. They're supposed to be friends of yours, and they already knew you were working on the case. If they saw you at the cafe at a table close enough to overhear their conversation, that wouldn't necessarily make them want to attack you, unless, of course, one of them was the killer. I round on him. Listen to you. The next thing I know, you'll be turning sleuth, too. He colors and bites back a grin. I could never hold a candle to you, Mom. I shake my head and look away. I'm not much of a sleuth. If I didn't keep getting hit over the head, I wouldn't have solved any crimes. At least this one didn't kidnap you, transport you to another city, and try to kill you, David adds. You know, now that you bring it up, I tell Zack, you're right about the Johnsons. They didn't say anything at the table that I didn't already know. If they saw me sitting there, they would have no reason to think I overheard anything incriminating. That wouldn't make them want to attack me. We can ask around the cafe tomorrow and find out if anyone saw anything, David goes on. I'd like to question the Johnsons, I tell him. I'd like to see their reaction when I tell them I was hit over the head within minutes of them leaving the cafe. 
All right. He takes something out of his pocket and hands it to me. I examine a large white envelope. What's this? It's a little present from me to you, just to show you how much you mean to me. I raise my eyebrows. An envelope? That's your present to me? It's the lab results from that glove you pinched from Betty's house. The blood does not match Florence Smith. It does match Betty Smith. It's her own blood. She could have cut herself with her gardening shears for all we know or care. The glove doesn't prove anything. I blink down at the envelope in my hand. You tested it? But you said... Yes, I tested it, he returns. I did it for you to put your mind at rest and to show you that crime never pays. I sincerely hope you've learned your lesson. I have, I mutter. Thank you. He bends down and kisses me. I have to go pick up Ariel. I'll come back and check on you, but I wouldn't be surprised if they take a scan and release you. He glances at Zack. Keep me posted. Chapter 10 David is right. After they scan my head, the doctors determine there's no sign of damage, and Zack drives me home. I go straight to bed and sleep until the following morning. I wake up at 10 o'clock and listen to the empty house. Zack is manning the store this morning, so I don't have anything to do but lie here and convalesce. A loud knock rattles me out of a doze. I peek through the upstairs window and spot a police cruiser parked at the curb. What's that here for? I shuffle downstairs in my slippers and bathrobe. When I open the front door, I find David looking fresh and eager. I scowl at him. Do you know what time it is? He snorts. Do you know what time it is? I said I would pick you up this morning so we could go find out if anyone saw anything outside the cafe. Remember? I rub my head. It still aches from yesterday. I remember now. He scans me up and down. Well, are you coming? Hold on, I'll... I wave over my shoulder and make a few more incoherent gestures before I scurry back inside. I shower and get dressed at a dignified pace before I meet him back on the porch. He suppresses a grin until we get in the car heading back to town. Do you still want to question the Johnsons? Of course, I return. Why wouldn't I? I just wondered if you felt up to it. If you want, I can take you home and you can spend the next week in bed. I'm not spending the next week in bed, I retort. I have a promotion to plan. His lips twitch. Uh-huh. I know what you're thinking, I fire back, and I'm not damaged beyond repair. I never said you were. I can still conduct my own affairs, I snap. I'm not going to seed, or being put out to pasture, or whatever it is you think I'm doing. I don't think you're doing anything of the sort, he returns. I just said you don't have to do anything you don't feel up to. That's all I said. I feel up to it. I feel fine. He casts a sly grin my way and goes back to driving. I hate that grin, probably because I realize how surly I'm acting. Maybe I should stay in bed until I can straighten out my attitude. No, I'm getting back on that horse. I don't care about any headache. Some things are more important, and the doctors gave me a clean bill of health. David parks in front of the candy store. Are you sure you don't want me to come with you? I think it will go over better coming from me alone, I tell him. They already know I'm involved in the investigation. If I show up with you, they'll think they're suspects. They are suspects, he points out. You know what I mean. 
If I go in alone, it will just be a conversation between acquaintances, rather than being interrogated by the police. He smiles again. Okay, I'll be right outside. I get out and saunter toward the ice cream parlor. I hope I look casual, but I'm really reluctant to question the Johnsons again. I don't want to get my personal affairs mixed up in this case, but I suppose I'm already way over my head when it comes to that. I let myself in. A bunch of sleigh bells jingle over the door to announce my arrival. The place really looks like a real ice cream parlor now, all except the neon open sign on the front window that isn't turned on yet. Cedric looks up from behind the freezer cases and beams. How are the milkshakes coming along? They're coming along well. I'm really happy with the chocolate one. I just need to start experimenting with the vanilla. Great, he replies. Let me know when you're ready for the next tub of ice cream. I'm ready now, I tell him. I have the freezer space now. He glances around. We'll have to send it over to you later today. We have an order coming in at two o'clock. Until then, this tub of vanilla is our only one, and we need it for the opening tomorrow. Tomorrow? I gasp. You're opening tomorrow? He breaks into an impish, childish smile. Yep. Congratulate me, Margaret. I can't wait. Congratulations, Cedric, I tell him. I'm sure you'll do well. Here's hoping. He settles down behind the counter. I only hope the weather isn't still too cold. I'm sure the promotion will help. How is it all shaping up? It's shaping up just fine, I reply. We still need to set a date, but that's not what I came to talk to you about. Really? What did you come to talk to us about? At that moment, Abigail appears from the back room. Hello, Margaret. How are you? Actually, that's what I came to talk to you about. I got hit over the head coming out of the happy-go-lucky cafe yesterday. Abigail utters a cry. Her hand flies to her heart, and she rushes to my side. Are you all right? You should go to the hospital. You might have a concussion or something. I take a deep breath. Here we go again. I did go to the hospital. I had a brain scan, and I'm fine. I have a headache, that's all. Who did it? Cedric asks. Who would attack someone in broad daylight like that? That's what I'm trying to figure out. As a matter of fact, it was about five minutes after you two left it. We were there at the same time. I was wondering if either of you saw anything while you were there. The two of them exchange glances. I can't tell what that glance means, or if it means nothing at all. Cedric frowns. You were there? I didn't see you. Neither did I, Abigail adds. If I had known you were in the cafe, I would have stopped and said hello. I cringe. I don't tell them I was hiding from them. That's very kind of you. When I saw you, you were involved in a very intent conversation with each other. You looked like you didn't want to be disturbed, so I kept a low profile. Cedric scowls even deeper. His mouth says, That was very considerate of you. But now I can see exactly what they're both thinking. They're wondering if I saw them talking to Betty when they're supposed to be fighting her in court. I don't say anything. If I say I didn't see them with Betty, that would be as good as admitting I did see them with Betty, wouldn't it? If I didn't see them with Betty, I never would have known she was there. Anyway, did either of you see anything outside? I ask. You didn't see anybody coming up behind me? We never saw you there at all, Cedric replies. Inside or outside. Oh, I wilt. Okay. What was I expecting? that one of them would confess to hitting me over the head? Not likely. 
I don't know what I was expecting, but it isn't this. I wasn't expecting them to act all normal and concerned and everything, but I should have. I nod to them both. Well, thanks anyway. I'll get started on the vanilla. Then we can work out a date for the promotion, but you'll probably want to get your opening out of the way first. We're flexible, Margaret, Cedric tells me. We're ready for the opening, so it's time to start organizing our business beyond that. Just let us know what date works for you. Okay, thanks. I veer for the door. I'll check my calendar and get back to you. See ya. I let myself out and beat it back to the cruiser. David puts down the radio. Anything? Zip, I tell him. Zilch. They don't know anything, and they didn't see me lurking around the cafe, eavesdropping on their conversation. They're concerned that I might have a concussion or something. Typical. He fires back. They wouldn't admit anything if they were involved. That's what I figured. Come on. He grabs the door handle. Let's go talk to Stacy. We head for the cafe and find Stacy in her office. She, too, acts shocked and horrified when she hears that I got attacked outside her establishment, but this time I can believe her outrage. She's one of my closest friends. I know she didn't hit me over the head. After we determine that she didn't see anything, she takes us to the kitchen and the wait station to question all her staff. She even contacts some employees who were on duty yesterday to ask them if they saw anything, but none of them did. When she starts rifling her computer to find out what customers came into the cafe for lunch yesterday, I hold up my hand. That's not necessary, Stacy. Thank you anyway. We'll get out of your hair now. Are you sure? She asks. It's no trouble. Really? I tell her. You've done more than enough. I'm grateful. Have a good rest of your day. David and I rendezvous on the sidewalk outside. Well? He asks. What do you think? I think we're sunk. I grumble. I think we're about three feet stuck in the mud with no way out. We don't have a single lead. We're at a dead end. It's match, set, and game to the killer, and we're out of luck. That's what I think. He scans Main Street. Hmm, you might be right. Don't say that! I bark. Don't you dare say I'm right! I can't be right! We can't be finished! That's impossible! We can't turn our backs on this case. This is Florence Smith we're talking about. We can't let the killer get away with it. Florence deserves justice, not to mention the rest of the town. I know, he murmurs. I'm not suggesting we turn our backs on the case. I'm just saying we're at a dead end. We've run all our leads to their ends. We need to regroup. Well, what do you suggest? I don't know, he muses. I have to go back to the office for a while. I'll go over all the evidence we've collected so far and see what I can come up with. We haven't collected any evidence so far. He chuckles. Don't worry. Something will come up. It always does. You'll see. I grouse to myself. I sure do hate to lose. Man, I hate to lose. The thought of the killer getting away with murder burns me up. He hugs me around the shoulders and kisses my forehead. I gotta go. Do you need a ride home? I shrug and jerk my thumb toward the candy store. I'm going to the store to work on my milkshakes. The Johnsons are sending over another tub of ice cream for me. I'll be doing that for the rest of the day. Maybe if I think about that, I won't stew about the case so much. Give it a rest for a few hours. That's the best way to get new ideas. He strides toward the cruiser. I'll get in touch with you later. He gets in his car and waves as he drives off. 
I fume in silent frustration, dragging my heels back to the candy store. There must be something here to throw a light on the case. We must be missing something. Chapter 11 I walk in on Gilly helping Zack behind the counter. The minute I show my face, Patty emerges from the storeroom. Hello, Patty, I say. What are you doing in here on your day off? Oh, just helping out. She takes out a broom and starts sweeping. Zack and Gilly work together to stock the jars. What about you, Mom? What are you up to? I'm going in the back to work on my milkshakes. If anyone asks, I'm not here. I go to my work table and take the last of the chocolate ice cream out of the freezer. I transfer what's left to a small plastic container to make room for the vanilla the Johnsons are sending over. I'm in the middle of tallying the ingredients that go into a single batch of chocolate milkshake when Zack sticks his head in. Abigail Johnson is here to see you, Mom. She has a tub of ice cream for you. Oh, good. I hustle to the front. Abigail smiles. Hard at work, I see. Here's your vanilla. You're early, I reply. Cedric said you wouldn't be ready to part with it before two o'clock. We are not open yet, she tells me. We won't need it before tomorrow, and we've got five more tubs coming with the order. I figured you could use it before then. How is it going in the back? Do you mind if I see your secret lab? I laugh. I'm starting to feel better about life. Sure, just don't touch anything. She laughs along with me. I haul the ice cream tub to my workstation and wave toward my blender. This is it. As you can see, it's highly scientific. It looks good. She points to my notes. I can see you're recording everything down to the micron. I wish. Do you want to try one of the shakes? She holds up her hands. Oh no, not me. I had to swear off ice cream years ago or I would get as big as a blimp. I have to get back to the store now anyway. I'll see you around. Don't drink too much of the product. She leaves me laughing. She and Cedric really are good people. I'm lucky to have them as new neighbors. They're going to make great additions to the Main Street business community. I scoop the vanilla into the blender, add milk and malt powder, and dump in a helping of canned pineapple. This is going to be delicious. I put on the lid and flip it on. The familiar grinding noise fills the back room. When it's nice and smooth, I carry the blender and a few cups to the front. All right, people, who would like to be my guinea pigs for the day? Gilly comes over. What flavor is it today, Margaret? Pineapple. I've been waiting for days to try this out. Ooh! She rubs her hands together. Pineapple, my favorite. I pour a helping into a cup and hand it to her. She takes a sip. Mmm, it's perfect, Margaret. Zack strides over. I think I better quality control this sample. We can't have you putting this out to our customers without executive approval. I laugh at the joke. I can't even remember now what made me so annoyed a few minutes before. I hand him a cup, and he gulps it down. It's pretty good, Mom. Good job. Does that get your official executive stamp of approval? I ask. He walks away, tilting the cup to his lips. Definitely. How about you, Patty? I ask. Do you want to try it? No, thanks. She doesn't stop pushing her broom. I just ate lunch, and I already ate dessert. Gilly holds out her cup. Give me some more, please, Margaret. I fill her cup with the remnant from the blender. That's all of it. 
I'm going to make a few more flavors. I'll let you know when I need your taste buds again. I take the blender back to the sink. I jot a few pineapple notes before cleaning out the equipment for the next flavor. This jar of maraschino cherries still burns a hole in my counter. I'll do them next. I dry the blender and set it up again. I scoop in more ice cream, dump in the milk, and add the cherries. I cover it and throw the switch. It grinds so loud I can't hear anything for a minute. The instant I turn it off, piercing screams rend the air. Margaret! Margaret! Come quick! I drop everything and dash to the front to find Patty kneeling next to Gilly on the floor. Zack lies not far away. They both convulse in spasms. Foaming saliva bubbles from their clenched teeth and their eyes roll back in their heads. I race to Zack's side. Zack! Zachary, wake up! I heave him into my arms, but he doesn't respond. Patty tries to shake Gilly, but it does no good. She keeps screaming indistinct words that set my hair on end. What happened? I bellow over the noise. I don't know, she shrieks. I was just sweeping and they were talking. All at once I turned around and they both dropped. It happened in a split second. Call 911. I order. Why I don't call 911 myself, I could never figure out. Patty fumbles for her phone and manages to translate the message across to the operator. When she finally hangs up, her voice flutters with agony. They're on their way. Then follows the longest, most excruciating delay of my life. Patty and I can only sit there and watch Zack and Gilly seizing on the floor. Just when I hope and pray it will be over, they go into more jerking, spitting fits. Neither of them responds to anything. After what seems like an eternity, a police cruiser pulls up outside. Officer Tomlinson, David's subordinate, gets out and comes into the candy store. When he sees what's going on, he says some gibberish into his shoulder radio. Then he nods to me. The ambulance is just pulling off the highway now. They'll be here any second. Just hang tight. Seizures aren't usually life-threatening. That's easy for him to say. This is my son lying unresponsive on the ground. My mind kicks into disaster mode. Could I have done something to prevent this? The ambulance crew wheels their stretcher into the candy store. Tomlinson takes my arm and guides me and Patty out of the way. I want to be sick. I want to die rather than watch the paramedics take my son away like this. Patty really does break down crying. She covers her mouth and tears stream down her cheeks. The medics bring in a second stretcher for Gilly and Patty throws up her hands. I can't watch this. I have to go. I'm so sorry, Margaret. I swallow hard, trying to get my voice working, but that lump stuck in my throat won't budge. That's okay, Patty. I'll close the store, and it will stay closed until Zack and Gilly are all right. If they aren't all right, well... I don't finish. If Zack and Gilly aren't all right, I don't want to run a candy store. If Zack and Gilly aren't all right, then I'm not all right. I don't want to be alive if they aren't all right. We should contact Gilly's parents, Tomlinson murmurs to me. Do you have a contact number for them? Dang, how stupid I am! How could I let my son hang out with this girl without getting an emergency contact for her parents? I hate myself for that. The medics raise their stretcher to remove her, but I lunge forward. Wait a second. I pat her down until I find her phone. When I take it out and step back, they continue on their way and load her up. In a second, 
They drive away, taking my most precious possessions with them. What's the use in a candy store without Zack? What's the use in anything? I stare down at Gilly's phone in my hand. I scroll to the contacts list and gulp down my despair when I see the word, Dad. What am I going to say to Gilly's father? He's a cop. He's a detective like David. He's David's friend. They've known each other for years. David told me that. If Gilly's father is anything like David, he'll be businesslike and cordial, although he might be brief and stern. I can't exactly blame him if he is. I gather my resolve and touch the name. The phone rings. God, I hate to think of him answering the phone, expecting to talk to his beloved daughter. Sure enough, he answers in a soft undertone. Hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? My heart sticks in my neck. Detective Hawthorne, this is Margaret Nichols from Nichols Candy Store in West End. My son Zachary is Gilly's boyfriend. As I expected, his voice goes cold and hard. He's a cop. He knows I wouldn't be calling him on Gilly's phone if it wasn't something pretty drastic. What can I do for you, Miss Nichols? I'm sorry to call you like this, sir, I tell him. But Zack and Gilly just got taken to Peterborough Hospital by ambulance. They were working in my candy store, and they both fell down in seizures. I... I guess it must have been 15 minutes ago now. I'm very sorry to tell you this. I have no idea what went wrong. It all happened so suddenly. Officer Tomlinson is here with me if you need to talk to him about anything, but Zack and Gilly are already on their way to Peterborough. I feel awful that I didn't have a contact number for you before now. It was terribly irresponsible of me. That's why I had to use Gilly's phone. That's all right, Miss Nichols. His voice says it's all right, but his tone says it's anything but. I'm going to the hospital now. I'll probably see you there. Thank you for letting me know. He hangs up. I stare at the phone for a minute more. I've never felt this awful in my life. I don't even have a car to get to the hospital. Tomlinson answers my prayers by murmuring in my ear. Come on, I'll drive you to the hospital. I walk outside in a blur. I don't know what to do with myself. I sidle toward Tomlinson's cruiser when an identical vehicle skids around the corner and screeches to a halt. David dives out and rushes to me. I just heard. What the devil is going on? Now that he's here, all my emotion erupts to the surface. I don't know. I was working on the milkshakes and Patty started screaming and when I came out they were having convulsions on the floor. I don't know what to do. My voice cracks. I can't hold back my tears. I collapse sobbing in his arms. He closes his protective embrace around me and nods to Tomlinson over my head. I'll handle this. Cordon the place off and lock up. There's an extra key in the top right-hand drawer of the desk in the office. I don't see Tomlinson again. David guides me toward his car. He tries to put me in the passenger seat, but I bolt upright, searching his face. They can't die, David. I won't let them. They can't. I can't live without them. What if something goes wrong? What if Zack dies? I couldn't live with that. He's all I've got. He's the only thing that makes my life worth living. He can't die, David. Easy, sweetheart. He croons. Take it easy now. He's not going to die. You'll see. Everything's going to be all right. I'm here, and I'm going to take you to him. All right? Come on, get in the car, and we'll go see what the doctors say. I can't lose him, David. I babble. I can't. My life isn't worth spit without him. I don't know what to do. We can't let him die. Promise me we won't let him die. He keeps saying, easy. He strokes the tears off my burning cheeks and his eyes glisten with emotion. 
We're going to do everything we can to help him. You don't have to do anything. Just get in the car and I'll handle everything. Come on, get in. That's the way. Nice and easy. He finally manages to sit me on the seat and shut the door. Then he goes into action. He gets behind the wheel and drives to Peterborough. I roil in despair the whole way there. I can't lose Zack. I won't. God or whoever runs this crazy old world can't let that happen. I won't allow it. I've always thought life was too good to be an accident. Now I'm not so sure. If anything happens to Zack, I'll have to change my opinion on that subject. I couldn't believe the world was a good place if anything happens to him. He's my light. He's my purpose to keep going. He's the best and brightest thing ever to happen to me. Almost everything I've done in my life that meant anything, I did for him. He kept me going in my darkest hours. He means a thousand times more to me than David or anyone else I can think of. He means more than my parents. He means more than my own life. I don't see the landscape passing beyond my tears. I can't stop thinking about him all the way to the hospital. He has to be all right. I can't go on if he isn't. David parks in front of the emergency entrance, the same entrance I walked through just... God, was it only yesterday? It seems like a thousand years ago. What was I thinking paying so much attention to myself? What was I thinking letting Zack pay so much attention to me? I should have been focused on him. I should have trained all my concern and energy on him and his well-being instead of being so absorbed in myself and my pathetic life. David escorts me into the waiting room. The minute we cross the threshold, a tall, square-shouldered man with brown hair and a beard barges up to David and shakes his hand. A slight woman covers her mouth with both hands and sobs. I recognize Rick and Sheila Hawthorne, Gilly's parents. I rush to Sheila's side and take her hands. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. She throws her arms around me, and we both burst into floods of tears. I hear David and Rick talking in a clipped, professional undertone behind us, but I can't stop crying. Is this what it feels like to lose a child? I don't want to ever feel this way again as long as I live. After a while, David taps me on the shoulder. Sheila and I turn around to find a woman in a white lab coat standing there. She waits, examining her clipboard, until Sheila and I pull ourselves together. How are they? David asks. They're in ICU now, the doctor tells us. They're both holding on, but they aren't out of the woods. If they get through the next twelve hours, they should be fine. Can you tell us what happened? Rick asked. How could this happen? Gilly didn't have any history of seizures. Considering that identical seizures struck both of them at the same time, the doctor replies, I find it unbelievable that the seizures were caused by any medical phenomenon. In fact, both of them suffered a severe reaction to a massive drug overdose. Drug overdose? Rick booms. That's preposterous. Gilly never did drugs in her life. Neither did Zack, I add. It's impossible. The doctor consults her clipboard. The drug we found in their systems was fexofenidine hydrochloride. It's a common pharmaceutical antihistamine, an allergy drug. The brand name for this particular drug is Allegra. You've probably heard of it. The four of us stare at each other in disbelief. That makes no sense, I stammer. Zack wasn't allergic to anything, and neither was Gilly that I know of. No, she wasn't, Sheila adds. Considering the levels of the drug involved, the doctor goes on. I would say not. No one would take the drug in these quantities, even if they had been prescribed the medication for the treatment of allergies. Then what are you saying? David asks. 
How do you explain it? The doctor shuts her clipboard. You're the cop here. You tell me. She walks away, and the four of us look at each other. Did she just say what I think she said? Sheila whispers. Someone dosed them with a massive quantity of a prescription allergy medication, Rick mutters. They dosed them with enough of it that they knew it would cause life-threatening seizures. Who would do that? I catch David looking at me, but I don't say anything. I can't think that. I can't even begin to conceptualize someone trying to hurt Zack. Him lying in an ICU bed right now is bad enough. Zack and Gilly drank the milkshake I made. I gave it to both of them a few minutes before this happened. What's the connection? Sheila and I settle down in the chairs for the long wait. We hold each other's hands. At least she's here. At least one other person on the planet knows what I'm going through. Rick and David pace around. They exchange the occasional snatch of whispered dialogue, but I don't pay attention to that. I train my whole awareness on one thing, getting through the next twelve hours. If my prayers and attention can keep Zack alive that long, that's all I need to do. Chapter 12 Stacy Kuntz, Simone Peretti, and Kyle Davidson burst into the waiting room. Stacy runs to me and clasps my hands. We came as soon as we could. The whole town is praying for you and that precious boy of yours. Have you heard anything? Not yet, I reply. We were just waiting to hear, and then we need to go get some sleep. We haven't had a wink all night. Simone puts her arms around Sheila. We're with you, sweetheart. No, we're with you. Sheila dabs her eyes. She and I haven't said a word to each other all night. There's nothing to say. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You don't have to worry about anything back in town, Kyle tells me. We're keeping an eye on your house and your store. You just concentrate on Zack and Gilly right now and leave the rest to us. Already, the weight compressing my shoulders feels lighter with my friends around me. I'm not as alone as I thought. Just then, the same female doctor emerges through the swinging doors and approaches us. Sheila hurries over to her. Doctor, can you tell us how Zack and Gilly are doing? They're holding their own now, but they're still in ICU. They're both suffering from cardiac arrhythmias. As soon as that clears up, we'll move them to the critical care unit. She leaves, just as David and Rick come back from the cafeteria. Rick hands Sheila a cup of coffee. What did she say? No news, Sheila tells him. The kids are suffering from cardiac arrhythmias. Once that clears up, they'll be moved out of ICU. She shakes her head. I... I can't stay here. I've got to get out of here before I lose my mind. I can't spend another twelve hours sitting around here waiting. I squeeze her arm. You go ahead. I'll call you the minute something happens. Rick puts his arms around her and supports her out of the waiting room. David draws near me. I have to go, too. I have to go relieve Tomlinson. He's been on duty for over twenty hours. What about you? I counter. You didn't sleep last night. I have to get back to town. If you need me, I'll be a phone call away. He's halfway out the door when Cedric and Abigail Johnson make their way through the sliding doors. They look around and come toward me. Abigail clasps my hands. Margaret! We can't tell you how upset we were when we heard the news. This is terrible. We just want you to know. We understand if you need to postpone the promotion. We know you didn't finish preparing all your milkshake experiments. We can work it out when Zachary gets out of the hospital. 
thank you so much for coming, I exclaim. I'm not sure when I'll be ready to take on anything beyond just looking after my family. We completely understand, Cedric tells me. We won't say anything more about it until you tell us you're ready to go ahead. I study the two of them. You two should be back in town for your opening. We postponed that, too, Abigail replies. This is so much more important. We couldn't think of doing anything happy or exciting with two of the town young people on the verge of death. That would be unthinkable. Her eyes tear over. She dives into her handbag and brings out a cotton handkerchief. I watch her dab her eyes and blow her nose. I'm amazed that a newcomer to town and a stranger could get so emotional about Zack and Gilly winding up in the hospital. I certainly appreciate your concern, I tell her. I'm grateful for all the support from everyone. Abigail scans the waiting room between sniffs. Would you like us to stay with you? We're happy to help out in any way. You don't have to do that, I reply. I have a few friends to wait with me, and I don't expect to get any news for a while. They said we would know for certain in twelve hours, and now it looks like it's going to be at least another twelve hours before they move Zack and Gilly out of ICU. Even then, I have no way of knowing how long they'll be in critical condition. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Abigail moves in close and pats my arm. You better stay here and get comfortable then. Let us know if we can do anything for you, anything at all. She and Cedric retreat. I still have three people around me, so I don't feel completely at sea when another person leaves. I sink into my chair again. Maybe Sheila had the right idea, and I should get out of here too. Maybe all this waiting will only drive me senseless. I can wait for news at home as well as I can here. I'm still overwhelmed by Abigail's compassion. She and Cedric really care about the people of West End if they drove all the way down here to check on me and Zack. Kyle wanders around the waiting room, reading every leaflet and poster in intricate detail. Simone finds herself a magazine, takes her spectacles out of her handbag, and starts working out the crossword puzzle. Stacy sits down next to me and presses my hand. How are you doing, girl? I heave a broken sigh. About like you'd expect. I want to stop living rather than think anyone could hurt my son. She cocks her head. What do you mean, hurt him? What makes you think that? Someone gave Zack and Gilly a massive overdose of some prescription allergy drug. That's what caused the seizures. Her eyes widen. You mean someone poisoned them? It sure looks that way. I just wish I could figure out who did this, but I don't seem to be able to concentrate on anything except worrying about Zack. Don't try to figure it out, she tells me. Leave it to the police for once in your life. You've been breaking your neck taking care of everyone else for too long. Let someone else take care of you. I have to smile at her. Thanks. I need to hear that right now. She puts out her hand to touch me when she explodes in an almighty sneeze. She struggles to get a hanky out of her pocket as one monstrous sneeze after another rips into her. She ends up huffing into her hanky before she wipes her eyes and blows her nose. She waves the hanky like a flag. Excuse me! Are you all right? I ask. It's just my hay fever. She sounds funny with her nose all blocked up. 
I always get it at this time of year. You haven't spent early spring in West End yet, but I sure hope you don't have hay fever. West End is the allergy capital of the eastern seaboard. I stare at her. Hay fever? It's Nepalin. She snuffles. When the poplar trees and the cherry trees and every other tree in the world starts flowering and sending out clouds of pollen, it wreaks havoc on my allergies. I gape at her in stunned shock. Stacy, you're brilliant! She freezes. I am? I stick out my hand. Give me your car keys, quick! What? She gasps. What do you want them for? I have to go. I leap out of my chair. I can't explain it right now, but I have to go check on something. It's urgent. Yeah, but what about... Her eyes dart toward the reception desk. You can call me if anything happens. This is way more important. I shove my hand toward her one more time. Please, Stacy, as a friend, please give me your car keys. She hesitates another instant. Then she dives into her pocket. All right. I know you wouldn't leave if it wasn't important. Just hurry back, okay? I seize the keys and give her a quick, smacking kiss on the cheek. You're the best. I love you. I make a break for the exit, exploding with a thousand ideas. Hay fever, allergies, it all fits together in one giant jigsaw puzzle. I bolt through the parking lot and almost have a lose my mind moment searching for Stacy's car. When I finally unlock it and get the ignition fired up, I peel out of the parking lot like a bat out of hell. I can hardly sit still all the way to West End. When I park in front of the candy store and see the cordon tape blocking the entrance, I cool my jets in a hurry. I won't be trespassing, crossing that cordon. This is my store. It's my property, and by God, I'm going to find out who tried to kill my son. I lift the tape and unlatch the door with my key. I let myself in and hear water running in the back room. My hackles rise. Who could be back there washing dishes at a time like this? It couldn't be Patty. She would never cross a police cordon, especially not after I told her I was closing the store until I knew Zack was okay. Someone back there really is trespassing, criminally trespassing on an official crime scene. I take the first step and pause in the entrance. Standing at the sink is Abigail Johnson. Why am I not surprised? In front of my eyes, she takes the lid off the blender, ready to dump the cherry milkshake down the sink. Of course she is. In slow motion, the pink liquid slumps toward the spout. At the last second, I call out, Stop! She glances over her shoulder and breaks into a beaming smile. Hey, what are you doing here? I thought you said you were going to be at the hospital for at least another twelve hours. I don't take my eyes off the blender. Put the blender down, Abigail, and step away from the sink. It's all right. I'm just helping out in any little way I can. She tosses the lid under the faucet and rinses it. That blender still hangs suspended in her right hand. I advance one cautious step. I utter each word with precise care and emphasis. Put the blender down, Abigail. This is a crime scene, and you're destroying evidence. Don't worry, she chirps. I was just... I can hardly believe my eyes when she swivels her wrist to dump out the milkshake. Before I can check myself, I charge forward and seize it in both hands. Don't! She maintains an iron grip on the handle and jerks it back. 
What are you doing, Margaret? Give me that! I try again to yank it out of her grasp. You poisoned Zack and Gilly. You dosed that ice cream with your allergy medicine to put me off Florence Smith's murder investigation. Admit it. What's the matter with you, Margaret? She gasps. I'm just trying to do the dishes. I'm trying to help you deal with your son being in the hospital. You're a murderer! All my pent-up emotion explodes out of me at once. You killed Florence Smith for her house. For a house, Abigail! How could you do that? How could you beat an old lady to death with a tire iron over a house? The whole time, we wrestle over the milkshake container. Sticky pink ooze sloshes over my hands, and I cringe. Every precious droplet represents priceless evidence that this evil witch tried to murder my son, not to mention Gilly and anyone else that happened to eat the ice cream she gave me. She roars in frustrated rage. With uncommon strength, she wrenches the glass pitcher out of my hands. The melted milkshake makes my fingers slippery, and my spirits evaporate when I feel it glide away. She wheels around in a pirouette. Without missing a beat, she wings the glass container at me and smashes me across the cheek. Stars erupt before my eyes, and I see black for a second. I try to hold myself upright, but after my recent head injury, I just can't maintain my balance. I teeter and fall. I crash onto the concrete floor with a skull-splitting impact. My cranium bounces with a sickening thud. In a heartbeat, Abigail pounces on top of me and shoves a gun in my face. Where did that come from? Who does the dishes with a gun handy? She snarls through clenched teeth. You just couldn't leave well enough alone, could you, Margaret? You were like every other goody-two-shoes busybody in every microscopic town in this country. You just can't seem to mind your own business. You had to go sticking your nose into everybody else's affairs, even when I told you not to. Now you got what you deserve. That son of yours might come out of this, but you sure won't. Abigail... I stammer. Shut up, she whispers. Just shut your interfering mouth for once in your life, Margaret, and let someone else think for a minute. Jesus Christ, people like you drive me up the frickin' wall. You think you're so good. You're just like that old hag. She thought she could just sit there in her stupid house dancing everybody else around on her puppet strings. She thought she was so much better than everybody else, and everybody had to pussyfoot around her and do everything her way. I flounder for something to say to her. If I can just get her to delay killing me, even for a few minutes, I might find a way out of this, but I can't move my limbs. Besides, that gun scares me stiff. I couldn't get away if I tried. She never wanted to sell her house, Abigail, I tell her. She had no reason to leave it, and you killed her. She was a good person, Abigail. She was a much better person than you are. You're darned right I killed her, Abigail snaps. And I enjoyed every second of it. I loved feeling her head cave in when I hit her that last time. She never knew what happened. That should make you feel better. I sneaked up behind her, and she dropped like an ox. There. Are you happy now, now that you know she didn't suffer? I swallow hard. You're evil, Abigail. You're plain, bald-faced evil. She breaks into a cackling laugh. If I didn't know she was the devil incarnate, that laugh confirms it. Only a fiend could kill someone and laugh about it like that. Good people like you and Florence always lose, she hisses. 
Only the strong survive. How do you think Cedric and I have become so successful? My eyes pop. Cedric? You mean... Oh, he's as innocent and trusting as you are, Margaret. He doesn't understand a thing about how the world works. He believes good always triumphs. Isn't that stupid? He doesn't know where half our money comes from. She laughs again. Then, with impossible slowness, she raises her thumb and cocks back her pistol hammer. She crams it against my nose. Goodbye, Margaret Nichols. It's been a pleasure knowing you. Chapter 13 Abigail's fingers tighten on the trigger. Is this the end of me? Is this what comes of all my sleuthing? I should have listened to Stacy. I should have stayed at the hospital and let the police handle this. Then I wouldn't be in this situation. Abigail Johnson leers into my face from inches away. At this range, she looks truly demonic. She grins in barbaric, sadistic glee, watching me squirm under her gun, and her grip tightens. I brace myself for the end, when, out of nowhere, the doorbells jingle. They send their familiar clatter through the store, and my heart sinks when the well-known voice rings out. Margaret, are you here? Abigail's head shoots up. She tenses all over and bares her teeth. David, what is he doing here? I have to stop him from coming in here unawares. Abigail rears and raises her gun to aim it at the door. She lets go of me and locks both hands around the weapon. She braces her arms, ready to fire. I can't let this happen. I can't let her shoot David. He's walking into a trap, and he doesn't even know it. I make a desperate dive to buck Abigail off. David's shadow casts across the floor, but I'm not looking at him. I vent all my ire on Abigail and that gun. Nothing else matters. I grab her to tackle her to the floor. I don't care if she shoots me, but I can't let her shoot David. I almost lost Zack. I can't lose David, too. I hit her with all my force, and the gun booms in my ear. It dazes me for an instant, but I'm too consumed with rage and ferocity to notice. I hurdle Abigail to one side and pound her into the concrete floor with all my strength. I dive on top of her. She whips her weapon around one more time to aim it at me. So much the better. Bring it on, girl. She swings it straight into my grasp. I clamp both hands around it and give an almighty jerk. I surprise myself by wrestling it away from her. I could have worked a lot harder, but it comes away in my hands. Without thinking, I haul it back and smash it into her face. I don't care if I kill her. I have to stop her by any means necessary. I club her across the nose. Her head lashes to one side and an ugly mark appears between her eyes. I brandish the weapon to hit her again, but she doesn't move. Her eyes close and she lies still under me. I wheeze for breath before I realize she's out cold. I stare down at her. I did it. She's not moving. She's not coming after me. A rattle draws my attention behind me. I spin around, still straddling Abigail, to see David stretched out on his side near the threshold. A paroxysm seizes me all over again. I drop the gun and leap across the room. David! I grab his shoulder and roll him over. David, are you all right? He groans and flops onto his back. Call, call 911, he rasps. I search him and discover him clutching his ribs. Blood pools between his fingers and his face goes white as a sheet. My heart contracts at the sight 
Oh, how could I be so selfish? I thought I would die without Zack. I never once gave a thought to what I would feel like if I lost David. I paw at my pockets, trying to locate my phone. When I finally get my fingers to obey me, my hands shake, holding the device to my ear. 911 emergency, the operator drones. Please state the nature of the emergency. There's a police officer shot in the chest. I do my best not to shriek at her. We need an ambulance and a police car right away. I'm dispatching an ambulance and police to your location now. Is your address 150 Main Street, West End? Adrenaline courses through me, so I don't know whether to laugh or cry or pass out right now. I can't be watching David bleeding from a gunshot wound. Somehow, I find a way to function through the rest of the call. I confirm the address and impress on the operator that the shooter is lying unconscious across the room from us right now. When I hang up, David's haggard visage hangs before my eyes. He gasps through pale, parted lips, and his eyes register hardly a flicker of recognition. Is she... is she out? Yeah, I breathe. She's out. He dips a slight nod. Cuff her, he pants. Cuff her. He lowers his eyes to his belt. I tear his cuffs off their leather clip and dive toward Abigail. My brain really isn't working right. I left the gun within inches of her hand. If she woke up, she could threaten us all over again. I roll her to one side and twist her arms behind her back. I snap the cuffs on and kick the gun toward David like they do in the movies. He nods again, but doesn't answer. I return to his side and put my arm around his shoulder. We should stop the bleeding. He tries to nod, but he only stares straight in front of him. I barely recognize the man I know. He looks like something from beyond the grave. Just staying alive takes all his massive strength. I look around and spot a first aid kit on the wall. I should get it and hold pressure on the wound. I can remember all my first aid training, but I can't force myself to leave his side. He needs me right now. At that moment, sirens approach from far away. I breathe easier when Tomlinson appears in the doorway with his sidearm drawn. He sweeps it around the room until he makes sure there's no danger. He squats down next to David and lays a hand on his shoulder. The ambulance is outside. I'll just tell them the scene is secure. David growls under his breath. Tomlinson leaves and the paramedics stream in. I get hustled out of the way. Now the agony sets in while I watch them work over him in a flurry of orders and procedures. I don't understand what they're doing. If he's going to survive this, they're the only ones who can help him. They load him on their contraption, but when they wheel him toward the exit, he thrusts out a hand to me. He says something under his oxygen mask. A female paramedic turns to me. You can ride with us if you want. He's asking you to stay with him. I grab that hand for dear life. I never let him go, not when they lift the bed into the ambulance, not all the way to the hospital, not when they unload him on the ramp. I only let go when they trundle him through the swinging doors and I lose sight of him in that white void they call a hospital. I stand and stare at nothing. How did my life come to this? How can the two people I care for most in the world be lying at death's door in this hospital? Stacy and Kyle materialize at my sides. They take my arms and conduct me back to the waiting area. I collapse into the same chair. This must be the waiting room for the afterlife. This must be what purgatory feels like, 
the place where lost souls wait to find out if they're going to heaven or hell. When Zack and David were alive and healthy and going about their business, I was in heaven, and I didn't even know it. Zack helped me with the store and planned to go to business school. He was dating Gilly, and I couldn't have been happier for them both. David was raising Ariel, the daughter he never knew he had. He was working to make West End safe. He earned the respect and admiration of everyone who knew him, especially me. That was my heaven. If anything happens to Zack or David, I'll be living in hell for the next several decades. Even now, I'm not sure I'm alive or dead. I can't feel a thing. The pain in my head holds me on a knife edge. Every nerve screams for release from this oppressive dread and foreboding. Something horrible is going to happen any second now, and I can't stop it. I stare down at my hands in my lap. Blood, milkshake, and something black like engine grease darken my fingers. I should go to the bathroom and wash my hands, but I can't move. I'm already dead. I'm a corpse waiting at the gates of limbo. No one can see me. No one can hear me or talk to me. I left my body behind in the world of the living. This shape sitting in this chair is just an apparition, a thought left over from my old life. That life seems so far away now, so unreal. From here... I can see how happy I was, how blessed. Only now, from beyond the grave, can I truly appreciate what I had. It's asking too much to hope I could ever feel that way again. Margaret Nichols? A voice startles me out of my trance. I look up to find the doctor standing in front of me. She doesn't try to comfort me. She doesn't try to get through to me. She's probably seen this living death enough times to recognize the signs. She bends down and murmurs low. I just wanted to let you know your son Zack and his friend Gilly are both safe. They're in the critical care ward now, but they'll both be transferred to the general ward within the next few hours. I just thought you'd like to know. Life crashes over me in a catastrophic wave. Tearing pain seizes my heart in a crushing grip. I can't stand it. In the blink of an eye, I'm alive again. I can feel everything. So much it hurts. And, and David? Is he going to be all right? They were prepping him for surgery, but when they saw the x-rays, they realized the bullet didn't puncture the lung. It nicked the pleural space, but it missed all his vital organs. He was very lucky. They're stitching him up. He's going to be fine, although he won't be working for the next couple of weeks, I'd say. She gives me a sympathetic smile. I'm pretty sure your son would like a visit from you now. You can go up to the sixth floor and see him whenever you're ready. She walks away. I can't hold all this cataclysmic weight crushing me to the ground. I'm breaking into a million pieces trying to contain it all, trying to understand how I feel right now. I feel like I'm dying all over again, but this time it hurts too much to bear. Stacy lays her hand on my shoulder and I can't, I can't. Tears spring to my eyes. All at once, it's all too much, and I burst into tears. She folds me in her arms, and Kyle holds me from the back. I let it all pour out of me. These people are strong enough to bear it. I'm not, but they are. They can hold me up. They can keep me together in one living piece until the storm passes. Chapter 14 Zack cracks his eyes open when I enter. Mom, 
You're here. I'm here, sweetheart. I sit down on the edge of his bed. I'll always be here. He gropes for my hand. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry about all of this. I clasp that hand and kiss his knuckles. You have nothing to be sorry about. It's me who should be apologizing to you. I'm so sorry I got you into this. It's all my fault. He shakes his head. I didn't appreciate you when I had the chance. I didn't realize that until this happened. I'm sorry. Tears well up in my eyes. I can't stop crying. The sight of him makes my heart twist in knots. I feel the same way about you. I love you so much, sweetheart. I couldn't live if anything happened to you. You've always been there for me, Mom. He drags his bleary eyes open. You've always been there for me, through everything. I don't know how to show you how much I love you. I feel like a clod for letting it go so long. I couldn't stop thinking I had to live so I could tell you how much I love you. I love you too, sweetheart. Tears streak down my cheeks, and I don't try to hold them back. Letting them out is the only way I'm going to make it through this. I thought the same thing. I wanted to die rather than lose you. You're the light of my life, Zachary. You always have been. Everything I've done has been my inept way of showing you how much I love you. I can't live without you. He holds out his arm to me, and I fall onto his chest. He hugs me and kisses my hair, and I break into fresh sobs. The human heart wasn't designed to sustain these torrential emotions. I feel like I'm drowning and losing my mind at the same time. I look up to see tears on his cheeks. I caress his precious face and he smiles in a twisted, agonized way. I can't stop feasting my eyes on his countenance, the countenance I love most in all the world. At last, he sniffs and wipes his hand across his nose. Anyway, I just had to say that. I laugh. How strange it feels to laugh. Relief floods me. He's all right, and he's going to be all right. I can start to relax all this tension holding me a prisoner. He looks around the room. Where's the detective? I thought he'd be with you. I lower my bloodshot eyes to his hand resting in mine. He's... he's downstairs. He got shot in the chest. Zack's eyes shoot open. Shot? I nod. The woman who killed Florence shot him. She was about to kill me, and he walked in at the wrong time. He's going to be okay. The bullet missed his lungs. He yanks his hands away. Well, what are you doing up here with me, then? Get down there. He needs you a lot more than I do. No one needs me more than you do, Zachary. I'm here because you're the most important person to me. Oh, nonsense, Mom. For someone who just survived getting poisoned, he got his energy back awfully fast. You know you love the detective, so go on downstairs where you belong. Quit mooning over me and go. That's an order. I smile and blush. If you really feel that way... I'm your son, Mom. He fires back. And I'm twenty years old. That's old enough to lie in a hospital bed without my mother hovering over me. I'm not in danger anymore, and he needs you, so go on. I stare at him in wonder. You're right. I do love him. Of course you do. And he loves you. You two need each other a lot more than I need you. I hesitate. Are you sure? I don't want to leave if you still need me. He scoffs. 
You'll be in the same building with me, Mom. Go. Go to him. I beam and kiss his hand again. Thanks. I dance out of the room. I wipe the tears off my face while I make my way back downstairs. I love David Graham. I love Zack. I love so many people I can't think straight right now. But mostly, I love David Graham. I've loved him for a long time, but it took this calamity to make me realize just how much I love him, how much I love everyone in my life. After making a few more inquiries, I find my way to his room. Kyle, Stacy, and Simone block the doorway. Kyle moves aside to make room for me, and I gaze in on David, lying pale and unmoving on the bed. He looks strange like this. I'm not used to seeing him vulnerable and hurt. An oxygen tube trails from his nose, and machines beep in time to his heartbeat. I find myself drifting toward the bed. Can this be the same man I fell in love with? His blonde hair tousles to one side. Every whisker on this face appears magnified, or maybe my heightened emotions make everything so startlingly clear. Irresistible magnetic force draws me closer until I sit down on the bed. His eyes drift open, and his vision clears. Does he see me? Yes! A flicker of recognition lights up his features. The man I know and love returns. He's alive in front of me. Hey, he breathes. How are you doing? I choke down sobs of relief and joy. I'm fine now that I know you're safe. Yeah. He sighs and sinks deeper into the bed. I can rest now that I see you're okay. I was worried sick when I heard you went back to town. How did you find out I was at the candy store? I ask. How did you know to come looking for me there? Stacy texted me. She said you broke out of here like someone lit a fire under your rear end. She told me all about her hay fever. I didn't know exactly where you were, but I guessed it had something to do with the drug getting into your milkshakes. I figured there weren't many places you would go besides the candy store. I can't hold back my tears. I cradle his hand in my grasp and kiss it with tear-stained lips. Hey, he murmurs. It's all right. Everything's all right. You caught Abigail, and now she's behind bars. I have trouble getting my mouth to work. Nothing is worth this. I don't want to solve murders if it means you and Zack are going to be in danger. Hey, come on now. He whispers again. It's not like that. You've solved so many crimes. This is the first time Zack or I have been in serious danger. Most of the time, it's you in danger. I don't care about that, I tell him. You two mean more to me than anything. I don't want to solve these cases if it means putting you in danger. It's not worth it. His eyes narrow. You might not care about your own safety, but what about us? How do you think we feel seeing you put yourself in danger? And for what? You don't have to solve these cases. You could mind your own business and let the police handle it. But... I stare at him. I thought you wanted me to. I thought you wanted me to be a community liaison for the police department. That doesn't require you to get kidnapped and held at gunpoint and shot at, he returns. Don't you know how hard it is for me? And I'm sure for Zack, too. Every time you get hurt. I bow over his hand. I never thought of that. No, you didn't. You only thought about others, not about yourself. But... I stammer. 
thought you enjoyed solving these cases with me. He broke into a smile, and his other hand drifted to my cheek. I do. I love it. I love every minute I spend with you, and I love sharing my passion with you. But you have to understand I would love you even without that. I'm sure we would find plenty to talk about. I dare to look up at him. When I do, I see his blue eyes glistening, but he's all smiles. He gazes into my soul with the same unbending intent. I'm all he sees. I try to say, yeah, but no sound comes out. I love him so much it hurts. I don't care what the future holds as long as he's in it, him and Zack. He tugs me toward him. Come here. I fold forward and my lips land on his. I collapse into his kiss. Everything's all right now. I'm home. Chapter 15 Zack hollers into the storeroom. Mom, Ariel and the detective are here. I'll be right out. I yell back. I string a piece of packing tape over the cardboard box of mint jujubes, shut and lock the storeroom, and hustle out to the front. Zack is just locking up and turning off the register while Gilly stacks the ATM receipts. Are you two about ready to go? I ask. I'll just go log these receipts. Zack takes the stack from Gilly. Then I will be. I turn to David. Where did you plan to take us for dinner? My place, he replies. My jaw drops with an audible gasp. Your place? He laughs at me. Don't sound so horrified. Ariel made sure the house passed her white glove inspection, so that tells you it's ship shape. I shut my mouth in a hurry. I'm not horrified. I've just... I've never been there in all the time we've known each other. That's why I figured it was time to change that. He puts his arm around Ariel's shoulders. I even cooked. Zack rubs his hands together. I can't wait to taste this. This is gonna be epic. David glares at him. You keep your place, sonny boy. I won't hear any critical comments from the peanut gallery. Zack bites back a grin. I wasn't implying I would be critical. I'm sure it will be epic. I mean, excellent. That's what I really meant to say. David shrugs his shoulders inside his jacket. That's a little more like it. You guys don't have to worry about Dad's cooking. Ariel chimes in. I made sure everything will be delicious. I wouldn't invite you over if it wasn't. Thank you, sweetheart, David tells her. Thank you for the vote of confidence. I have total confidence in you, too, I add. You've been practicing long enough to be a five-star chef. He cracks a grin. I wish. Just then... Someone knocks on the front window. I stiffen when I see Cedric Johnson peeping through the glass. What does he want? David growls. I don't know, I murmur. There's only one way to find out. I unlock the door, but I make sure not to open it too far. We're closed, Cedric. You'll have to come and get your candy tomorrow. I'm not here for candy. I was hoping we could talk, Margaret. I just... He digs his toe into the pavement and averts his gaze. I just need to talk to you. I hold myself alert, but he looks so hangdog and depressed that I relent. All right, but we're just going out to dinner. We'll be leaving soon. It won't take long. He ducks inside. He nods to David, 
who returns it with a curt jerk of his head. He doesn't smile, and he doesn't say anything. He makes no overture of friendliness towards Cedric at all, and I notice Ariel, Zack, and Gilly all watching him to see what he'll do. Cedric takes a deep breath. I just want to apologize to you, to all of you, for Abigail's behavior. I'm... I'm truly, truly sorry for what she did to you, to all of you. I still can't bring myself to accept that she killed that woman, and now she's... He breaks off. He stares at the floor and swallows hard before he manages to speak. Now she's in prison, serving a life sentence. It doesn't seem real. I let out a sigh. This is the last pigeon coming home to roost. We put Florence Smith's murder behind us, but one last piece of business remains to settle. I lay my hand on Cedric's shoulder. That's all right, Cedric. I know you didn't kill Florence. Abigail herself told me you were too good and kind to have anything to do with all her criminal activities, and I know you could never poison anyone with your ice cream. His head shoots up and his eyes narrow. What do you mean, all her criminal activities? I stiffen. Oh, that's right. You don't know. David chimes in. Know what? Abigail implied that she committed other crimes in other towns where she and Cedric set up ice cream parlors. She said that's where all their money came from, and that's how they became successful. Cedric groans and slaps his forehead. No, no, it can't be. David clears his throat. It looks like we have some more digging to do. If she did pull stunts like this in other towns, she must have left a paper trail. That could explain why you two moved around so much. Cedric glares at him. This is an outrage. I want you to know I had nothing to do with this, detective. I would never countenance any criminal behavior under any circumstances, especially not murder. I want you to understand that unequivocally. Then you won't mind cooperating with our investigation by making all your financial and business records available to us. David returns. That's the best way you can show us that you had nothing to do with this and that you have nothing to hide. Does that mean... He chokes back the words. Does that mean we'll have to forfeit all our, you know, our assets? David shrugs. That depends on what the investigation reveals. If Abigail gained assets and wealth through fraudulent or criminal means, those assets and funds will probably be seized to pay compensation and damages. But you don't have anything to worry about, Cedric. I tell him. Once the investigation proves you weren't involved, you'll be left with the proceeds from the work and investment you put into your businesses. I turn to David. Won't he? If you cooperate with the investigation, David tells Cedric. I'm sure the judge will find a way to be lenient and to compensate you for your trouble. The law protects your livelihood from seizure, which in your case would be your business. Whatever other assets you've got will be up for grabs, though, depending on just how criminal her activities turn out to be. And you've got the whole West End community supporting you, I add. You've got your business, and you've got people behind you who care about you and will go out of their ways to help. You don't have to go through this alone. Cedric brightens up. Thank you, Margaret. That means the world to me. Where are you going to live, though? Zack chimes in. You can't keep living at the Overlook Hotel forever. No, I'm renting a room in a house, Cedric replies. 
With Abigail gone and my future up in the air, I'm downsizing. I sold almost all our belongings that we had in storage, so I'm traveling light. I won't buy a house until this case settles, and I know for certain what my financial position is. Really? That's great! I exclaim. Who are you renting from? Stacy Coons. She has extra space since her kids moved out, so she decided to rent out a few spare rooms. That's wonderful! I clasp his hand. I'm so proud of you. You're going to come out of this stronger and happier and better off. Abigail was an albatross around your neck. Your life will improve without her in it. I couldn't agree more. And like you say, I still have my business. He peers into my eyes. That's one other thing I wanted to ask you about, Margaret. Would you by any chance be ready to start working on our promotion again? He scans the faces around me. It's been two weeks, and it seems all your loved ones are back to normal. What do you say? Shall we start planning again? I check David, Ariel, Zack, and Gilly, but their features give me no clues. Why do I hesitate? I know Cedric would never do any of the underhanded things Abigail did. Zack speaks up. I don't know about you guys, but I never want to taste another milkshake again as long as I live. Me neither, Gilly adds. To my surprise, Cedric just laughs. I understand completely. How about it, Margaret? I'll supply all the ice cream you need. All right, I think I can handle that and I wouldn't want all my planning and experimentation to go to waste. Great! He claps his hands. I'll email you, and we can work out a date. Thanks again, Margaret. I watch him hustle back to his store. Well, that didn't turn out like I expected. He's a nice man, Gilly chips in. I'm glad you forgave him, Margaret. I would hate to see him lose out over something his evil wife did. You're right. He is a nice man, I reply. And he's going to lose a lot more than his wife in all this. He has as much right to be angry at Abigail as the rest of us. She used criminal means to get wealthy and prosperous, but she only wound up destroying both their lives in the process. I'm glad you see it that way. David puts his arm around my shoulder. Now, I suggest we shoot out to the beach and take a walk in the sunshine and fresh air. The days are getting longer, and we still have two hours before dinner is served at Chateau Graham. The whole group bursts out laughing. We stream for the door, all talking at once. Outside, David, Ariel, and I bundle into David's car. Zack and Gilly take Zack's car, and we rendezvous at the beach. I get out into a blustery, chill wind. It whips off the white caps, but the sun shines and makes everything sparkle. I smell spring in the air. The Overlook Hotel sits in its proud place on the cliff top. It presides over the beach and everything around it with a sense of majesty. David slips his hand into mine, but Ariel tears onto the sand, shrieking a wild war whoop. Come on, let's go! What are you all standing around for? Zack bursts into a run. I'm gonna catch you, Ariel. You better watch out! She shrieks louder than ever and dodges to get away from him. In a minute, Zack, Ariel, and Gilly run far down the beach and away. They leave me and David alone to gaze after them. He twists my arm to hold my hand behind my back to draw me close. Well, Miss Nichols, shall we proceed to supervise these wild heathens?
I smile, but instead of proceeding, I glance down at his chest. How are you feeling? You're not supposed to do anything strenuous for a month until your wound heals up. It's only been two weeks since you got shot. He grins down at me. I hardly call taking a walk on the beach straining myself. If you asked me to play tag with that bunch, I might have to think it over first. Under the circumstances, though, I can handle a slow meander. You let me know if you feel any pain or anything, okay? He salutes with his free hand. Yes, ma'am. I have to stop myself from elbowing him in the ribs. Stop that. You know I hate that. Considering the way you're smiling, I'd say you don't hate it too much. His grin fades. I want to tell you I'm proud of the way you handled Cedric. I didn't want to say anything in front of the kids because I know praise embarrasses you, but I agree with Gilly. You did the right thing by forgiving him and giving him a second chance. You're a truly compassionate and generous soul. I couldn't exactly hold it against him, I return. This explains why he was so adamant when we questioned him that he didn't do anything. Abigail let him answer all our questions. He certainly convinced me. Me too, he replies. I still can't figure out their alibi, though. They claimed they were asleep in their hotel room the night Florence died. Abigail must have slipped out after Cedric fell asleep. Maybe he's a heavier sleeper than he realizes. She didn't just slip out, David points out. She left the room, drove to West End, killed Florence, and drove all the way back. I shrug. It's possible, though. Not only is it possible, it's the only explanation that fits the circumstances. Cedric can't confirm Abigail's alibi because he was sound asleep. I suppose you're right. Didn't she explain it in her confession? I ask. She would have had to give a full statement to plead guilty to the crime. The court wouldn't accept her plea without it. I didn't read her statement, he tells me. Once she got taken into custody, I left it to the lawyers to work out. I cock my head to examine him. I was a little surprised that you forgave him. I thought you would hold it against him more. How could I? he asks. He didn't shoot me. I know that, but from the way you scowled at him when he first walked in, I thought maybe you might still be sore about it. He rubs his side and grimaces. I am still sore about it. Will you quit clowning? I punch him in the shoulder instead of elbowing him. Can't you be serious for two seconds? Around you? Not much. He laughs. Seriously, it's not easy to let go when someone hurts you. I wasn't sure how it was going to go with him operating a business across the street from you when I suspected him of the murder and his wife turned out to be the killer. When he first walked in, I was actually more concerned about his reaction. I wasn't sure if he would be able to put the past behind him and start over. I guess that still remains to be seen. You're right. I shade my eyes, looking toward the waves. Ariel, Zack, and Gilly no longer race around. Now they stroll together while Ariel pretends to dance in and out of the waves. David follows my gaze, and we stand together for a long time. At last, he voices my innermost thoughts by whispering under his breath, Life is good. It's good because you're in it. I take a deep breath and turn to face him. I lay my hand against his cheek. I am so eternally grateful to have you in my life. I love you, and I can't imagine my life without you. I love you too, Margaret. 
His blue eyes sparkle down into mine with rare intensity. I never want this to end. Me neither. I stand on my tiptoes to kiss him. We float in a daze of kissing in slow, sensual delirium. The waves sizzle in my ears and the wind moans with a forlorn sound, but I couldn't be happier. When he pulls away, he towers over me for what seems like eons, just stroking my cheek and staring down into my soul. I could stay like this forever. I don't need any more. All the people I love are here. They fill me with such bliss and happiness I don't know what to do with myself. Time stands still and my brain shuts off. All at once, Zack whizzes past me, yelling, Hey, get a room, lovebirds. Then he breaks into impish laughter. Leave him alone, Gilly calls. David bites his lip and draws himself out of my arms. He rounds on Zack and points at him. You wait, Sonny. When I'm healthy and strong again, I'm going to get you for that. Zack wiggles his fingers in the air and waggles his backside. Ooh, I'm so scared. With no warning, David lunges for Zack. He can move a lot faster than I thought, even if he is still recovering from a gunshot wound. Zack isn't expecting that either. He tries to break and run, but David catches him by the arm. Zack shrieks, half laughing, half screaming, but David doesn't let go. He whips Zack around and delivers several stinging spanks to his buttocks. Zack flails and fights, but David remains unmerciful. I have to stand back and laugh at their antics. When it's all over, David releases Zack and straightens his jacket. Let that be a lesson to you. Straighten up, or I'll have to deal with you very severely. Zack walks away, rubbing his behind and laughing. I can't wait. Gilly and Ariel join us. Gilly hugs Zack in between wiping away tears of laughter. Ariel runs up to her father. Good job, Dad. I've been itching to give him one of those for weeks. Hey! Zack protests. I thought we were friends. David returns to me and puts his arm around me. Come on, everybody. Let's head back to my house. Dinner's awaiting. This has been Sweets Assessment by Wendy Meadows. Narrated by Lily Jane.